the other microphone and just kind of be closer to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Okay. One, two, three. Okay. I'm on this microphone and I can hear myself now. That's a good. Actually, I can't hear myself. Um, but everybody else can hear us, I think. <laughs> so that's a good start. can't hear me either? One moment. OK. Uh. OK, now I can hear myself. You can hear yourself. Oh, I should put on the headset, right? Or do I have no? Um. This. Wait a moment. So everyone who's uh, who's watching to this, I'm so sorry. Don't worry. This is like we're totally professional. This is a work in progress. You can see Julius there working, who is our artist. <laughs> um, we're gonna have this figured out any moment. It's just regular growing pains, I guess. We're still figuring this out as we go. Julius, can you speak? Are, are they able to How's that? I think so. Yeah. Is this this one that's working now? It's it should be, but it's okay. So, so I can I can see the. No, it shows you as muted. Wait, now it works. Okay. So now now you can hear me. No. <laughs> all right. Wait, 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 wait. The audio level is all the way down. Let's. Okay. Let <laughs> now they can hear. You. Oh, great! So I'm coming through. Yes. Okay, then we're awesome there. Good. Yay. <laughs> Good, good, good. Okay, I guess I hmm. have a microphone or two that works. Oh my God. Hey, I'm Marcus. <laughs> uh, I'm with the Porpoise Conservation Society. And I'm here today with my friend Julius, who is on camera too. We're, fi we're hey. figuring this out very slowly <laughs> as we go along. We'll get there. Uh, Thanks so much for watching. Um, this is uh, Currents and Canvas, or Canvas and Currents. Um, it's our live art program, uh, which we want to do once a month. Um, and I'm with Dr. Julius Chitney. He is uh, my special guest. He is um, he's an award-winning artist and also a microbiologist. Um, he has a PhD in microbiology. He, his work has been featured in the Smithsonian. Uh, your murals are everywhere. You've been reproduced on stamps and on uh, coins, and you've published books. Like, he's a really big deal, and I'm so happy to have him here today. Uh, we're going to talk about killer whales, uh, and Julius is going to create a piece of art depicting killer whales. And uh, we're going to talk to you, uh, wherever you are. We're broadcasting on seven channels right now. So there's a lot of people watching. And we're so grateful for you uh, to be with us today. Um, Julius, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what we're going to be seeing from you for sure. today? Sounds good. Uh, thank you, Marcus. Uh, yeah, this is exciting, guys. Uh, this is the first of our broadcasts of, of Canvas and Currents. And so uh, this is Marcus's brainchild. And we kind of both kind of worked out some of the details with it, and I'm just really excited to see where this goes. Um, on this first episode, we're going to be dealing with killer whales or orcas, uh, and uh, we're going to talk about their fascinating biology, uh, their conservation status and issues, uh, and uh, just some really neat things about orcas. These are some of the most fantastic animals on the planet, I think, uh, and they are just fascinating beyond belief and I'm going to be while talking about it between the two of us here I'm going to be doing uh, an image and be uh, actually doing colored pencil on uh, on a um, pastel paper uh, black pastel paper I really like working with light on dark and uh, that's going to depict a pair of orcas and uh, so we'll see if I can get that all finished in time it's going to be a real relatively faster one but yeah so that's what we're going to be doing well I can't wait to, uh, to check in on that and and uh... I guess I'm, I'm just going to show your your working surface sure. today as we figure out how this works. And I'm mm -hmm. so sorry, I've got a new video mixer. I'm still figuring out how this works as we are on air. So um, it's it's pretty much also like a little bit of a secret behind the scenes tour today, where you get to see everything as it is. We don't we don't varnish anything over. This is like the real thing. There we go. Exactly. 
exactly. So that's it there. Um, and uh, so what I've set up here, just a really rough sketch, because I'm going to be adding the, the color and the tones to it with colored pencil, is a pair of orcas. And so in this particular scene, we have a, a mother orca that is pushing her newborn calf to the surface to help it breathe uh, not long after it's been born. So uh, it's going to be, you know, a little bit of larger piece here, but because it's on dark paper, uh, it's going to be actually pretty easy to set this up um, without a lot of um, too much uh, um, coloring the whole thing. So this is going to be sort of like nighttime kind of a scene or close to nighttime kind of a scene. And we'll see how far we can get today with this. But um, I'll talk about the various parts of it as I go. And this is just a rough sketch here, so we're going to fill that out. Um, so this is where it, it gets kind of fun because we get to chat about the orcas while we do it. This is very much like the other sort of how to draw webinars that I've done with a variety of other organizations. Uh, but in this case, it's going to be more like I'm doing the artwork a little bit more refined than just the line art. And um, it's fun because we get to chat about all the fascinating things about the organisms. So. I'm I'm so excited, so excited the fact that I almost forgot to put my microphone back on. Um, yeah, our regular viewers, by the way, if in the background you could notice that porpoise there, we've got an a real neon porpoise. It's the most exciting thing for me this week. Um, Julius, maybe you can uh, start by just. Uh, getting us set up if, if anybody wants to draw along. Yes. Uh, they don't necessarily need to use the same medium, right? Exactly. Absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm going to be working with colored pencils uh, in a, you know, a variety of colors, but you know, you can just do an outline, you know, whatever you like, pen on paper, pencil on paper, crayons, whatever. Uh, the idea here is I've got a particular shape that I've set up, and I'll go over it as I, as I sort of lighten or darken the, the bits, and so then we'll get to see how to draw the various parts of it. Um, and while I do that, I'm going to talk about orcas as well. And um, so orcas are, oh yeah, also called killer whales, right? That's a very common um, name that are, a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, they are top predators. They're apex predators. They are actually probably the most, if there is an, a top apex predator in the ocean, orcas probably sit there. They have eaten great white sharks. They, they tend to favor their livers. So they, they, will, they are able to hunt great white sharks even, which are otherwise, uh, to many people, known as some of the most fearsome predators in the ocean. Also, a relatively undeserved reputation in terms of the, the fear that they invoke. But we're going to deal with orcas here. And orcas are a whole different animal. They are intelligent. They are exceptionally gentle with us. I think it's fascinating that that's the case, actually. Um, but they are able to take down large whales when hunting in packs sometimes. They've been known to kill baleen whales sometimes. It's just, you know, it's the way, their way. It's not good or bad or wrong. It's They need food. This is how the, the world works. And um, from my days uh, in ecology, uh, Marcus mentioned I have a a background in microbiology. Before that, it was in ecology that I did my master's. And so I got to deal with all sorts of fascinating interactions between animals. And predators require prey, just like we require food. And that's, that's how it is. It's not that they're violent. It's just this is, well, you know, that's how it works. But anyway, so they're killer whales. Uh, the word killer whale, I particularly don't like that much because it does invoke a bit of uh, unnecessary fear for people, especially because they're so gentle with us. So orcas are interesting because the word orca actually um, is from the Latin, spelled the same, which means whale. But um, their scientific name is Orcanus, orca. And it's kind of interesting when you think about it. Uh, the, the, the term Orcanus means uh, of the realm of the dead. So when you think about it, Orcanus, orca means whale from the realm of the dead. It's kind of a, I'm not entirely sure what was the reason why they came up with that. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we have fun as scientists uh, naming animals w that when we describe them. And so it's kind of interesting to select some of these kind of things. I've done that with some of the organisms I've described where I've invoked mythology even in the name. So it's kind of fun that way. And we're still learning, right? We, we just learned a few things just minutes ago before the show. Uh, Absolutely. Reading up Absolutely. on this. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's fascinating to do these kinds of shows because you learn so much. I love the learning experience that they provide. So I'm going to start drawing the, the orca here. And so I'm going to start... Uh, using start from the nose and uh, or the rostrum uh, and the chin uh, and I've got a white 
pencil with me here because again I'm working on black so I'm going to be adding that but also because the orca has some really nice white markings on it and it's a specially beautiful animal for that as well I think I'm using um, these colored pencils here uh, you can use whatever you like but um, and then actually if you can just focus is it possible to do like a manual focus on the paper that would auto focus uh, my hand I'm not sure if that's the case because that would be even better but if not this all good we'll, we'll work on it and so here you can see that the whales snout it's relatively short it's a dolphin orcas are dolphins right so um, a lot of dolphins we're familiar with have long snouts these long uh, beaks but orcas have a relatively short beak and they do have what's called a melon this is that that sort of rounded part on top of their at, at their forehead and that is where they house um, the uh, this is where uh, the, the, the um, whales that use echolocation, for example, they have special um, adaptations in their skull and in the soft tissues in their melon, and that's how they're able to tr um, process some of this information and to generate the, the strong directional sound waves that they use to be able to determine where uh, and how large and various other um, characteristics of objects in their environment. And so that's a, an important uh, feature of the melon. Uh, and then orcas also have this short sn uh, snout or beak, and uh, it is relatively short. Uh, it's curved, but the mouth is very slightly underslung, which means it's slightly uh, down below the tip, but very slightly. And then the mouth comes up into a very, very slight smile. This is kind of like a Mona Lisa smile they have, a very small amount. And then their eye is usually actually quite relatively invisible when you're looking at an orca because their black and white markings are so overwhelmingly um, noticeable. But I put the eye in here and it's almost right in line with the mouth. A lot of dolphins have that actually. The eye is just about right in line with the mouth. But right behind the eye, there's this huge white patch. And um, this is one of their characteristic markings in orcas. It's this beautiful white eye spot. It's not an eye, it's behind the eye but it is uh, a very, very distinctive feature and no other dolphin has this particular marking uh, that is alive today. So this is actually kind of a neat way that's really easy to identify orcas. If you see that eye spot, you've got an orca for sure. Um, and so then they've got this rounded chin. Now inside of their mouth there are all these amazing huge teeth and they are apex predators, they really use those teeth effectively against their prey. But we don't see them in this case. This is more of a maternal moment here. Very peaceful. The mother is tending to its calf. Actually, um, Marcus, I'd like to share my screen here, actually. And this is, I'm just going to go into the thing here. And I think I've, we've set this up before last time. <laughs> I'm just going to just going to yes. go there. Um, because I've got a, a couple of graphics that I'd like to um, share with you. And here we go. Yeah. Yeah, Joe. So if you can share your screen. This is under present, right? Yes. Yeah, that's what we had. <laughs> share screen. Excellent. Okay, good. We totally um, know what we're doing. It's like. Yeah, this is all. This is. Yeah, we're working it out. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. Uh huh. Here we go. And uh, now I am. Oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. I can choose. Okay. Okay, here we go. Did I already launch? Okay, here it is. Sorry, guys. <laughs> this always <laughs> takes a bit of a while. Um, looking to see if I can. I just you want to. What? I just want to say to... that if you're if you're watching there from you wherever you're watching, you can uh, leave comments through the platform where you're watching. So if you're watching on Twitter, I think you can just comment there. If you're watching on Twitch or on YouTube, you can just use the chat there. <laughs> and the same is true for LinkedIn and all the other channels where we are. So wherever you're watching us from, you can leave your comments in. Uh, the chat there and uh, Julius can see them and I can see them so awesome. and I can see and your screen yes so, yeah, so um, what I'd like to point out here is we are talking today um, especially about one group of orcas now orcas are really diverse actually you wouldn't think of it if you looked at at one um, you know a lot of people think you know orca the one appearance but they're really diverse in their appearance and in the genetic um, diversity so what I have here um, is uh, it's a little graphic that I produced to show uh, a couple of different types of orcas. I wonder if I can maybe... Oh, here we go. Make that better. Okay. Um, orcas are currently uh, defined by one species, Orcanus orca. They're just classified as one species. However, recently in 2010 and then again in I think it's 2017, there were a couple of um, research papers that were published that indicate that there may actually be up to uh, three or four different kinds of orcas. 
uh, maybe uh, that would qualify as different species. Uh, what we have here on our coast in British Columbia, from where we are broadcasting, uh, is a, a couple of different types. And they're different in their appearance, but especially more in their culture, which is really fascinating. We have two kinds that we encounter off the coast here, uh, off the coast of Vancouver. Um, and one of them is called the, uh, the Biggs orcas or the transient orcas. Those ones hunt marine mammals like seals. And then the other types are the residents. And in our area, we have the southern resident population, which is made up of three pods. Uh, they're codenamed J, K, and L. And then they have numbers associated with them to define the individual. And southern resident orcas, as many people know from the news, a lot these days are very are critically endangered. They are there's only currently 74 individuals in existence and down from a historical minimum of about 140 individuals or so. So they've actually gone down and they're still just just hovering there. We need they need some help, basically. But what you'll notice here is that in this drawing, I've shown some of the dif differences between different kinds of orcas in the world. So the ones on the right, which were this is all part of a how to draw webinar from before. It shows kind of the lines I used to define the shape of the orcas. The ones on the right there, the outlines, those are kind of our southern resident uh, types. They are a very typical looking one for the Pacific Ocean, for the East Pacific. Um, and um, you'll see they have a, a relatively large eye spot. Uh, and then the, the, the males have especially this really tall dorsal fin. The females have a, a curved or falcate dorsal fin that is smaller than the males, but it's also quite large. Now, there are a couple of other kinds that are genetically distinct from our resident orcas. And resident orcas, by the way, eat salmon, uh, especially the southern residents specifically. They eat uh, Chinook salmon almost exclusively. There's a little bit of variation, but almost exclusively Chinook salmon. So we really got to be careful with maintaining um, our, our behavior so that we don't, you know, deplete those stocks of, of uh, Chinook salmon, on which they rely for survival. It's part of their cultural difference from the transients, which is amazing. Uh, so you also see, however, in the southern oceans, you get this really neat thing happening. Orcas are also common in Antarctica, and you might have seen some fascinating videos of orcas hunting seals on uh, pack ice, where they actually work together to topple or, or wash water over the um, over the, the the ice flows and cause the seal to be pushed into the water. So. You have um, a type called the pack ice orca, or the type B is uh, it's been codenamed as. And it's actually similar overall to our um, uh, resident orcas here, except they have a larger eye spot even, a big white spot. And they're often sort of grayish or greenish yellow in color. And that's uh, due likely to the presence of diatoms that build up on their bodies over time. Diatoms are a type of algae. And diatoms are photosynthetic, so they're not generally harmful, but over time they can produce um, conditions that the orca that are unhealthy for the orca. So sometimes they actually swim to different waters to allow these diatoms to be sloughed off from their bodies. It's actually necessary. But that changes their color, in, in fact. You get this greenish yellow color. Uh, then there's a, a C-type orca, which is the Ross Sea orca, and it actually looks vastly different in some ways because you look at the, the face and that eye spot is slanted forward and it has this sort of teardrop shape where the back end, it, it just tapers out to almost nothing. That's a really neat kind as well. And then finally, there's one that is so different that not only the coloration is different, but the actual shape of the animal is also different. The sub-Antarctic orca, the type D uh, has only been seen a few times, but it has almost no eye spot, which is really unusual for orca, very tiny. And it's shaped a little bit more like a pilot whale. The head is more bulbous uh, than, than the, the other orcas with this you know, further swept back melon and the, the larangar beak. This one has almost no beak and it has this, this very square, squared off head, fascinating stuff. So this is another one, and it has a smaller dorsal fin too. So huge diversity hidden among orcas. Anyway, that I wanted to point out uh, as something important. Now we only have about 70, or actually 74 individuals of our southern resident orcas. There are other populations that are even less uh, populous. For example, there are the Iberian orcas, which number less than 40 probably. And these are the ones that have been associated with, um, and we'll talk about this some more in, in, in a little more detail later, with um, allegedly attacking some of the, um, the yachts. Uh, and we'll discuss some of that, that, it, that there's some interesting ideas about that's not all necessarily uh, aggression, but a lot of it may be play behavior. 
Uh, but something we'll have to keep in mind about that. And in total, in the world, when you think about it, you know, orcas seem pretty healthy in terms of their overall population, right? But how many are there in the world? Uh, I wonder if you can guess uh, about that among yourselves. And if you make a guess, you might think, you know, I don't know, a lot of people would think maybe millions and millions. In fact, the entire population of orcas all around the planet of all of these different kinds is only about 50,000. That's wow. tiny. That's like the size of a medium sized town or a small city. Uh, for humans. That, that's nothing. For animal yes, populations, exactly. we talk about porpoises, right? Harbor porpoises, there's somewhere between 750,000 and 1 million of them <laughs> in comparison. Different. That's like more than an order of magnitude greater, more than 10 times as much. So orcas are actually not very common. This is sort of a, a, a thing that you often see with apex predators. They require a lot of prey. There are very much fewer of them than their prey typically. So that's sort of normal. But when we're talking about this small number globally, that means that they are actually in, in you know, there's a lot of threat they can face, and we have to take this very seriously because they can easily change numbers, right? And uh, so, yeah, we really have to be careful. On our coast here, we only have about 2,500 orcas. So it's really small. That's like a good-sized conference of people. Um, <laughs> it's, so yeah, again, we gotta put this into context, everything, that this is why we're doing these kinds of outreach, because we want people to be aware of how vulnerable our neighbors of other species are very important. So back to the orca drawing in the meantime. I want to, I want to, yes. I want to just get in here. Uh, we do have a comment from uh, Cindy. A question. Excellent. She oh, this asked, is the fun part of the interaction. <laughs> she asked, "Can you comment about the skin lesions uh, that we see on the southern resident killer whales or orcas?" Right. Um, personally, I don't know too much about that, but I think what you're talking about here are the skin lesions that sometimes develop as a result of. Partly the, the diatomaceous cover that they, uh, uh, they sometimes develop. Uh, there may be other ones as well, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but they do suffer uh, health complications from the presence of these diatoms over time. And I believe that the skin lesions are one of them, and they have to actually move to different waters for them to clear these up. Uh, and then that also removes the, the diatoms over time. Um, uh, if there's somebody else who knows more about this, uh, let me know because I, you know, I want to clarify that I'm not an ARCA specialist here, but you know, I've read about them, but there's a few things that I've certainly missed. Uh, but this sounds like it might be what you're talking about. Yeah, and then I, Mandy just said that slow reproductive rates, of course, don't help. That's true. Good point. And we had another comment. Yeah, there's only like since July 2021, there was 74 measured. And then since then, there's there's been one death and one birth. So really low rate of reproduction. And so naturally, we're not going to have a lot of replacement of, of dead individuals. So we have to be very careful. Um, in 2018, there was um, it was a J35 um, from their southern resident population that became famous for pushing around her her dead calf uh, for 17 days. She, just like in this uh, image I'm doing where they kind of helped to push them up to the surface with their snout, this one kept pushing her baby for 17 days even though the baby had died shortly after birth. It was really heartbreaking to see, but also indicates how incredibly strong the bond is. The family bonds in these animals, it's spectacular, and they really are family oriented. They're matriarchal, so they're actually, um, their societies are sort of held together by this, this uh, central old female who is the mother of many of them uh, within that. And um, they, the, the, the young learn from their parents a lot. They develop culture because they transfer information by teaching their young. Their young watch their parents learn how to hunt. There are different dialects uh, between orcas uh, using their, their very complex communication by whistles and uh, various kinds of sounds they make. And they also have different hunting strategies that are learned in different areas. So some of them have specific strategies for hunting different kinds of animals. And so what we're looking at is not just a species that looks different among different individuals, but vastly different kinds of cultures. And we should, we should strive to protect these cultures as we protect human cultures. They are no less important in many ways because they are another entire other species and their culture is worth preserving as well. Uh, and we can learn so much from them. Um, so I'm actually going to be uh, continuing the drawing here. So if we want to switch to that, we're going to see. I'm putting in some of the, the, the highlights of the edges here. Now I'm not trying to put too heavy a line on the edge because what I want to do ultimately is let the image speak for itself without the edges, but I want the shading to speak for, for defining the volume. So it's just light lines 
and then I'm going to add the, the, the tones to it as I go. But what you see here is after the mouth, so that, sorry, the, the, the top of the orca is generally black, beautiful jet black, except in those situations uh, where the uh, diatoms have accumulated on it. Um, and in those situations, it tends to be a little bit of yellowish greenish, but in general, it's a jet black. Underneath, it's bright white. And there's this beautiful sharp, sharp line between the two uh, halves. And so what we have here is that's basically the shape of the head of the animal. And then right behind the head, not long after that eye spot, is uh, this pair of pectoral fins, uh, or flippers. They're called flippers in whales. Uh, and they are homologous or derived evolutionarily from the same uh, structures embryologically as our hands and arms. So they are the equivalent of the hands. In fact, whales evolved, amazingly, from land-dwelling mammal ancestors uh, way, way, way back in the Eocene, or maybe even the Paleocene, um, so long ago, over 50 million years ago. And in those predecessors, they look nothing like whales of today, actually. They, they ran on the ground. But over time, their descendants uh, became better and better adapted for life in the water, uh, going through a stage that resembled something like a crocodile or a giant seal, um, through to fully aquatic ones that nevertheless require air to breathe. They have no gills, right? And um, now, the ones that survive today all look like um, like really well adapted organisms that can swim in the water. But there's a blowhole on top, which is right around here, and that is the equivalent of their nostrils uh, that take in air and then uh, take in you know, oxygen rich air and expel the carbon dioxide rich uh, um, breath that they exhale. Um, so here we're going to add, we're going to move this over a bit to show more of the, the body, and it kind of thickens a bit toward the dorsal fin. So we've got both of the flippers here. And then I'm adding some more bodies. I go further back. And it starts to narrow and taper back down a little bit after the dorsal fin. I haven't put the dorsal fin in yet. Remember I mentioned that males and females have different sized dorsal fins and different shapes? Well, here we go. This is the, where we can see that it's a female because if I draw the dorsal fin, it's what we call falcate, uh, which is kind of hooked and bent backward in this case. And it's not terribly tall. It's, it's impressively tall for a dolphin. Not many dolphins have proportionally this high dorsal fins. They're beautiful. But in females, they're uh, shorter than that of a male. Males have this incredibly tall and very straight dorsal fin relatively. It's, a, it's an interesting way, an easy way to distinguish between really adult males and females in a pod. And of course, a pod is a group of whales, right? So there we go. So that's the female dorsal fin. We're going backward now along the back of the torso. Uh, and then here, as we near the flukes or the tail, um, we're going to uh, have another marking on it. The marking is this very, also very distinctive sort of um, backward swept, um, what would you call it? Kind of like a, you know how Canada geese have that white uh, sort of thing under their chin, almost like a, a, a strap um, to like a chin strap sort of thing. Well, it's kind of like that, but it's really big. It's a large backward pointed, like a wave, cresting wave. And then at the bottom, uh, there's this stripe of white that connects that to the belly um, back from the, the pectoral fins or the flippers. And then after this wave-shaped uh, sort of saddling mark underneath their belly, there's a short little bit of white in the center of the belly, uh, and then it stops. And then it continues again at the tail. There's another little bit of white that happens there. So it picks up. Uh, at the tail or the flukes, and it starts white right underneath, just before the, the flukes begin. And then the bottom of the flukes or the tail, uh, um, the sort of the tail flipper, we call them flukes, uh, is mostly white with a black rim on the underside. But on the upper side, it's black, jet black. So um, there's only one more marking that we have to put into the animal. And that is this interesting saddle-shaped marking that differs again between different um, types of, of, of orcas a little bit. So it kind of starts out just behind the dorsal fin and it sweeps forward and is shaped kind of a little bit vaguely like a saddle. And it's much fainter than the white markings elsewhere. It's just basically usually grayish. But um, these other marks on the underside are bright white. 
Uh, interesting thought now, why would we have lighter colored undersides or white undersides in animals? Uh, and it's less clearly the case in, in orcas in some ways, but it's still the same sort of effect. This is called counter shading. Counter shading is very important for animals living on land and in the water. Because what it does is cancel out the whale's own shadows um, uh, by the bulk of its body from its underside. And that's important because that makes it basically vanish into the uh, background when you see it from a distance underwater. Because they, there's less of a difference between the bright upper side and the dark underside um, caused by sunlight hitting the top and then shadow on the bottom. If you brighten the bottom of the animal, that means that that relative that, that change is less obvious and the whale kind of more looks like a, a single tone uh, altogether. That's important for predators hiding from their prey and prey hiding from their predators. So that is employed here as well by orcas. Uh, it's maybe less obvious in some ways because they have this interesting kind of color patterns in addition to that. The, the wave shape thing, the eye spot. But there's another weird thing that happens there is that if you look at what's called dazzle camouflage, um, and I, I wonder about this. I've not read about this, but I want, I'm speculating here. I'm just wondering, and I'd be curious to find out more about this, is that ships in World War I, I think it is, employed this weird kind of very effective form of camouflage called dazzle camouflage, where they paint the ship in all kinds of weird sharp edged stripes and various uh, polygons on the side of the ship. And amazingly, that actually made it um, blend into the, the horizon better in some ways than, than it just the smoother gradient tones. And I'm curious uh, if anybody's done any, any work on whether that is also the case in some cases of marine mammals, because a lot of dolphins that have these really sharply defined changes in color. Who knows? Anyway, uh, our orca has these beautiful bright markings. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to ask is, um, Marcus, are you, um, are you familiar with why a fluke is called a fluke? <laughs> no, actually, that, that's a good one. I have no idea, honestly. Well, this is, this is interesting because I, I just looked this up recently, and uh, a fluke uh, actually comes from the German flugel, which means... No way. Um, it means wing. Exactly. So um, it, it does look a lot like a wing. It actually looks like bird wings. Uh, whales' flukes look a lot like bird wings, and in fact, that is the, the derivation of it. So there we go. Uh, a little bit of a, a, an etymology lesson there as well we have, so it's kind of fun. I just, I just want to remind everyone. If you have any comments, or any ideas, if you want to, if you want Julius to do something, or me for that matter, or if you have any questions about killer whales or orcas, uh, today's your chance. So please use the chat function or the comment function, depending on which platform you're watching on, and uh, let us know. Um, awesome. I, I can't stand on my head, so um, just a, a fair warning there. It would be really, really messy. So I'm not going to be able to do that, uh, but I will draw. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so let's let's start adding some of the tones to the animal. This is where it gets fun. This is the part that I really enjoy. So here we go. A couple of things to remember. As I'm starting to add the tones uh, onto the animal, because remember I wanted that to speak mostly to the final image of, uh, appearance of the drawing. Uh, it's bright white at the bottom, but we're also dealing with the shadows of the animal on itself. Okay, so we can't just make it bright, bright white all the way. So what I do is I start to. Uh, shade. And I'm using the side of the pencil because, and this is really nice textured paper, so it picks up uh, color really nicely like this, or picks up the, the, the pigments nicely, uh, and distributes them in a way that minimizes the amount of, of those lines that result when you use a pencil and just kind of go shade back and forth. I want to minimize that. I want to make it smooth looking. So using the side of your pencil is actually often very effective for that. And as I mentioned, having a, a textured paper, this is meant for pastels, but it works really well for uh, colored pencils as well. That, that tooth to the paper, that, that roughness is useful because it, it breaks up these lines um, visually. And so you have this much smoother, uh, tones happening. So again, I'm not making it bright, bright, white right away because I am starting with a tone that's closer to that at the very bottom of the animal where you have the greatest amount of shadow. Now, if this animal is out at sea in deep water, the underside of the animal will in fact be the darkest part. But if it is actually near to shore, close enough in shallow water that the bottom, that the benthos or the bottom of the water, the seabed is brightly lit by the sun, then we also have some backlighting, some light that is scattered and reflected from the, the, the benthos at the bottom that then gets, that hits the underside of the whale. And then you have this slightly brighter area at the very bottom of the whale. And then it shades a little bit darker as you go higher and then it's bright again on top. 
Okay, I'm so excited. I finally found out how to how to get rid of the picture in picture mode. Oh, excellent. <laughs> we're, we're really working this out, which is great because, uh, you know, this is just going to improve over time as we make more of these episodes. So what you're seeing here is the the very first uh, uh, sort of like the, the debut one where we're still picking out some of the bugs, and that's okay. So actually, um, what I wanted to do is I'll... I'll share this other image that I have. Let me just uh, let me just actually stop sharing first. You're really making me work for my money here. I know, trying I know. To, well, trying somebody's got to keep your toes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Oh, I already got that one there. Good. Okay, so I'm just going to switch to the screen sharing here again. There it is. Okay. All right, here we go. Oh, why am I backstage? <laughs> oh, you're backstage? Apparently, yeah. There we go. Um, that, that's it. That's yes. okay. Oh, maybe because no, that's okay. That's fine. You I have to share your screen first, mm -hmm. then yep, I can yep, add yep. you back. <laughs> See, we are working we're, this. We're out figuring here. this out. It's, <laughs> it's totally professional. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, there we go. So this is an example um, of what I'm talking about. When you see the the animal. Um, it is, and this is a drawing I did actually that depicts a really fun, fascinating behavior of some of our, I think the transient or bigs orcas actually, uh, near the Sunshine Coast actually. There's an area north of us, north of Vancouver, where there's a shallow region near the shore with a lot of these smooth stones. And it's very, very shallow. It's so shallow that in some parts the whales can, can't even pass fully in the water without exposing some of their dorsal fin or back. Uh, above the water. And what they do is they they swim into the shallow area and they rub their bellies on the rocks. Uh, and I don't think anybody really knows fully, fully why they're doing it, but it probably feels good, just like uh, belly rubs feel good for a lot of animals. Um, my doggy loves belly rubs as well. Uh, and, and a lot of other animals do end up like, scratching themselves. You'll see bears itching themselves on uh, against tree trunks and so on. So animals do various kinds of things like this. Partly, it's often to remove um, parasites that build up, but not always. Sometimes it just feels good to do something like this. So, so this image, you can see that's what it's doing here. But also what I want to point out is look at um, what I was talking about when it's in shallow water. When the part that's actually right near the stones there, at the very bottom, is lit up by this greenish-blue light um, that has, been, has had some of the red filtered out of it uh, as it's passed from the air through the water surface, down through the water column, and then bounced off the, the stones at the bottom. By the time it reaches the bottom, it's already lacking some of the red, which is why things look blue underwater, relatively. And the deeper you go, the deeper this blue looks. And so the light that's cast back onto the orca's belly is this bluish green color. And so now you have this whale that has its own shadow, that grayish color, or that slightly bluish gray, but also a little bit of backlighting or, or backscattered light that is lighting up the very, very bottom of its belly um, that is close to the rock there. So really interesting things to keep in mind about the, the sort of the dynamics of, of the lighting. Uh, that animals underwater experience and how we as artists have to depict them if we want to be really accurate about this. Um, I just want to point out that the picture that people are seeing there on screen, I, I just noticed your signature. That's actually yep. a, a painting. It's not, I know it looks well, a lot like a oh, sorry, photograph, yeah, it's, but it's a digital painting. Right. It's one it's of yours. It's a digital painting. Yes, exactly. That's right. So uh, most of my work actually is digital. I'm a scientific illustrator. So I find it very effective to work with tablet and computer and stylus instead of like a um, a, a pencil and paper because uh, doing scientific illustrations either for press release images for a scientist or museum murals or stamps or coins or books, um, I find that it's more effective to use digital illustration because it's easier to modify things as we go. And a lot of the time working with scientific teams, we need to change things along the way. Sometimes new discoveries are made that, that make some of the, the features uh, older or out of date. And sometimes I, of course, need to, you know, I don't, I don't know everything, I make mistakes and they point out to me how to revise it to make it more accurate because they're the experts in their field and that allows me to more easily do it. I started with watercolor and having to repaint an entire painting, if there's an error in it, this is not, it's, it's, a, it's a big waste of time for me. I can't really afford to do that because it's not easy making a living as an artist, you really have to be efficient. So, so digital illustration is really effective for that. But I still love to do traditional techniques and that's what we're doing today here. Uh, and it's a really great way to teach as well. So now I've uh, added a lot of the white on the underside here, but again, this is the white near the bottom. So we just explained about how it works with shadows. The other thing to keep in mind is that when you're doing these, sometimes you can sort of convey some of the shape of the animal. So I've been kind of doing these straight lines this way, okay? sort of an angled, but 
you can also, if you have time and the inclination, you can make lines that kind of curve in a way that would, you know, if you had like grid lines along the animal that were like squares, these grid lines would, would create these apparent curves on the animal when viewed from an angle. Um, and when you do this, it sort of conveys a little bit of that curvature of the animal's uh, belly. So that's one way to do it, and especially if you're employing a technique called hatching, which is where you shade using just lines and not making this smooth gradient like I am with a, a colored pencil here. And that's something that's useful for pen and ink, for example, where you really can't do smooth gradients sometimes because it's kind of like a quantum situation. There's no ink or full ink. There's nothing in between sometimes. So you have to shade with lines if you want to shade. And in that situation, these curved lines, slightly curved lines, um, laying them out parallel to each other, um, are a really effective way not just to create the, the certain tone based on the spacing of the lines, but also to convey something about the overall shape of the animal, that third dimension that we're trying to be able to convey in our drawings when we do these two-dimensional drawings. Anything to kind of help us to enhance that appearance of depth helps. And those kinds of curved lines are one of the techniques that we use to, to uh, convey that. So I'm adding that. Now, when we get to the top here uh, of this white area, we're going to start to make it brighter because, again, this is outside of that shade uh, caused by the animal on its own belly uh, because it's intercepting, uh, its upper side is intercepting the sunlight. So what I'm going to start to do now that I've got that, that light area pretty much blocked in similar to the tone we needed on the underside is we're going to start to add some of the lighter areas, some of the highlights caused by the sun brightening up that white area. And one of the places we see that is along the jawline. So uh, right under the, the, under the beak of the whale, a very, very small beak, uh, this, this line of white here, this is where the mouth is placed. That, the mouth completely bisects the black and white areas. And the very, very edge of the mouth, kind of like where our lips would be, it kind of just slightly curves a little bit inward. And that little bit of curvature, especially because this whale is kind of turned upward toward the sun anyway, is lit up more brightly by the sun than underneath it. And there's a very strong curvature that happens there. So I'm going to make this bit of a line here. This gets, gets smaller, gets less prominent the further back I go, because toward the back here, the mouth kind of, you know, it, it vanishes because it... it there's a crease at the corner of the mouth, basically, but at the front here is where it's um, most prominent. Okay, sort of like that. And then I'm also going to start to add a little bit more brightness to the upper part of this, because again, it's curved, right? The, the animal's cross section is curved. And so here on this upper part of the where the white area ends abruptly, that's where the brightest part is going to be, because that is closer to the top of the animal. Over here, uh, in some places, it's actually facing sideways, right? It's pointing out toward the uh, side of the ocean, not toward the, the, the surface. But at that point, there's a lot more scattered light that will hit it. And so it gets gradually brighter and brighter uh, as we go up along the side of the animal. So over time, you know, sometimes you have to do this in several layers, basically. You, you do one application, you come back to it, and you add another application. Um, you kind of get to know how much pressure you need to add to it with experience. And working with traditional techniques instead of digital, I have to be careful because what I produce here, it's hard to erase because colored pencils are less erasable than regular pencil. There's no undo command like there is in digital <laughs> art. So that's one of the things that, that, that I have to watch when I switch to traditional techniques. I always want to reach for the control Z or or you know the the undo shortcut on my uh, on my remote for the tablet. Uh, there's no <laughs> such thing in life, uh, so we we have to be more careful about that when we're using traditional artwork techniques. It, it gets more difficult as you like keep trying to hit keys on your keyboard that yeah. without actually having a keyboard. Uh, I want to bring up one of the questions uh, mm -hmm. that have been submitted online uh, earlier. We were talking about the resident uh, orcas, and uh, the question is, why don't the resident uh, whales hunt seals? That's, a, that's an interesting question. It's an awesome question, actually. Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's the short answer. Uh, but I, I heard this question asked at one of the marine mammal um, symposiums that are held here, usually yearly. At the at UBC, and somebody did ask that, and um, let's see if I remember the answer. But we don't really know. There is there is a chance. Now, one of the things that predators 
will exhibit is something called prey switching. So when they're under pressure, let's say their normal prey is not available at all, some predators are able to change their behavior and switch to a different kind of prey. Sometimes they can do that, sometimes they can't. Sometimes they are physiologically required, that their body only functions by eating a certain kind of prey. So sometimes there has been evolution that has made them absolutely require a certain kind of prey or a certain range of prey at least. I don't know to what extent that would be the case with um, resident killer whales, um, but we do know that they show these distinct differences in culture. So chances are, at the very least, the reason why they eat these specific fish is that's what they learn to do and that's what they've specialized on. Now, I'm, I wonder whether they'd be able to switch to another form of fish or mammals if given the if they were required to in case let's say chinook salmon became so depleted that they no longer could survive on them um, one of the problems is that you have two types of of orcas here we have the bigs or the transients and the residents and they uh, feed on different prey and this is something that we see a lot in populations of animals populations or species that are able to coexist we have different niches that they fill and a niche is a basically a way of life and it, it it can include things like where exactly it lives you know what kinds of nests it makes what kinds of foods it eats and we have something called niche differentiation which means that organisms or animals that that live in the same place typically have to evolve different niche to occupy different niches or else they will directly compete with each other and one will often outcompete the other and lead to its extirpation or extinction. And so you have two or orca populations that are managing to coexist in the same waters by differentiating the kinds of foods they eat. So if the southern resident uh, orcas were to switch to seals, now they would be competing directly with the big orcas or the transients, and that would put a lot of pressure on them as well, because they, they, there's, you know, the, the populations that they they grow to, are such that those are the what what the prey supports typically. Uh, there are various kinds of limitations on their population, so prey isn't the only one. You have other kinds of pressures, habitat fragmentation, uh, you know, uh, disease, all sorts of other things, but. When you have a, pop, a stable population feeding on a particular resource, when you have another population moving that, that competes for those resources, more often than not, we start to see a, uh, one of the populations are both suffering in their, in their, in their size, basically. So that's another thing. Uh, it's a complex kind of a, a thing to answer, and I don't know if anybody's actually managed to answer whether they're able to switch to another form of fish or to some other form of, uh, of, of meat. If they're able to, I guess it... It takes quite a bit of them to uh, quite a, quite a bit to make that switch. It's not something they randomly decide like point. one afternoon. They're like, nah, you exactly. know, we can't find it. Let's let's switch species. Like it's not it's it's an it's a process that takes a little bit more time. Especially right? with a social animal that requires learning from others uh, of the same species, they would have to teach a whole new generation this switch. And mm -hmm. so it's a lot more complicated than an individual in a solitary species choosing to eat something differently. Yeah. So here you can see I'm starting to actually uh, lighten this up. So I can see this takes a bit of time, but uh, for today I'm going to actually speed things along a little bit more. Uh, in time, if I had a lot more time, I would refine this a lot more. But for now, we want to kind of move ahead with this, and so I'm just kind of moving a little bit quicker in this part. Now when we move up on the side of the whale, but you can already see how the shadow at the bottom is preserved now. And we have this brighter area on the sides. As we move up, now I'm going to do the eye spot. The eye spot is even higher on the animal than that upper part of the, the white belly or the white throat. And so this is going to be even brighter by a bit. Again, notice the shape of the eye spot in our uh, southern resident whales. It's not gigantic like the B-type uh, um, Ross Sea, or not Ross Sea, but the pack ice uh, orcas from the southern hemisphere. But it's also bigger than that teardrop-shaped tiny eye spot of the Ross Sea um, in the Type C orcas. And far, far larger than the, the D-type ones, which have almost no eye spot. Did we, did we talk about how many, how many ecotypes or different populations oh, there are? Like, no, there not fully. Really. There are actually a lot of different kinds, and there are slight differences between different ones. I talked about the like four very, very different looking ones, uh, and that might actually be genetic. They are genetically different and may actually represent uh, new species that could actually be um, described as new species, and we might see that in the future, actually. But there are far more uh, 
ecotypes than just these. Actually, I, I follow the, the posts of, um, of Emma Luck. Uh, she does this uh, on, on Facebook. She does the um, Emma Luck, um, um, the Northern Naturalist. Yes, um, I think it is, and and just she's she, she was both... a contributor for the Purpose Conservation oh, Society too at some time, so wonderful. I know her as well. Yes, she has from um, a, from Alaska. She's from Alaska, from Alaska. and she okay, sees killer it. whales and porpoises, dulse porpoises, oh hubble porpoises there all the time. She's a wonderful illustrator. She does all of her own work, and uh, she has wonderful posts that share all kinds of fascinating information about different ecotypes of or orcas and different kinds of of. of uh, things that are current in the news. It just, it's just really fun to uh, follow. So that's a great person to, uh, to, to see. The other one I, I follow a lot is Jackie Hildering, the marine detective. And she has, she always um, notifies us whenever there are, like, so there's these um, underwater microphones that are in certain locations, and sometimes they'll pick up the songs of whales, like humpbacks or orcas. And she'll often notify us when they're active and and and, and um, making these beautiful songs and so you can then listen into these uh, these underwater microphones and and live hear what's happening under our waters with these beautiful whale songs happening right then it's amazing it's just so tranquil and therapeutic so there's some really wonderful people doing wonderful work out there the other thing I would like to mention here is that this uh, this drawing that I'm doing right now um, I'm actually, I'm going to dedicate it uh, to my friend Andy, who is an absolute force of nature when it comes to conservation, biological conservation. He is one of those people that are so on the front lines of protecting, uh, sometimes directly protecting animals from poaching. Um, also, uh, does spectacular work in, in humanitarian work, um, protecting uh human populations from, from, from terrible uh, kinds of things that happen during wars and such. But I just want to say that there are some individuals. Now, we can all do absolutely spectacular work, and don't let anybody ever tell you you can't. But Andy's the kind of person that is so incredibly inspiring to me um, because I see how much of the effort he puts into it, how much energy of his life he puts into it. This kind of person these kinds of people, and there are a lot of them, but there are a few really exceptional ones. They make such a disproportionate impact on the rest of us by inspiring us and showing us an example of what we can do when we put our mind to it. And I think it's so important for us these days to be able to do that. Um, so Andy, thank you for all the work you do. Thank you every conservation uh, worker who is doing things out there for all that you do and every one of you for doing everything that you are doing and have more ideas to do to help us protect this beautiful planet, living planet on which we live. Um, and thank you, Julius. Thank you, too. <laughs> I mean, uh, you're My a conservationist pleasure. in your own right, and you're pretty much... I, I, don't, I don't even know how you get your work done <laughs> in, in between protecting old growth forest and working to protect the vaquita and, and doing streams like this today. By the way, one funny comment mm -hmm. uh, that I wanted to read out is... Uh, by bad game on 999 <laughs> who writes uh, in all the years I've been a follower I've never seen a human stream on this channel so oh um... wow look at that <laughs> yeah, we're streaming yes indeed and 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 we're streaming humans uh uh, talking about whales, so significantly cool. less fur on Julius than what we normally show on that yeah, stream. Yeah, I, so. I kind of shaved today, so yeah. there's a little bit less fur there. But um, yeah, uh, I, I should I should maybe grow a beard and maybe become a real mammal. Uh, but no, I think I'll just stay this way. So you can see now I've actually added the the eye spot, and it's brighter, right? And so that's something that we're seeing now. It's all actually the same color. Um, but in fact, the, the highlights of the sun are kind of neat uh, in their effects. And this is what gives us this, this feeling of volume. Our brains are programmed uh, to interpret these differences in tone, uh, not as different colors on the same individual, but to put it into the context of lighting. And it shows and, and it conveys to us, to our brains, uh, the shape of the animal, given the lighting conditions in which we are uh, are, are existing. Uh, cool little thing on the way here, on my drive here, I actually noticed on the, on the lane opposite me, there was this truck that uh, appeared, just kind of noticed it really rapidly. Then it was an interesting, it was a semi-truck that was sort of this olive -y, grayish, greenish yellow um, pulling a gray trailer. And I thought, that is such a neat color for, for a vehicle. I'd never seen that before. And in a split second, it changed. It suddenly <laughs> became yellow, uh, pulling a white trailer. And it was an example of how my brain had failed to notice at first that it was in the shade 
I saw all the other cars in sunlight. It was in the shade, and so my brain immediately assumed it was uh, it was lit up like the rest of the cars, and was in fact a sunlit yellowish um, olive, where in fact. It was a yellow truck that was in the shade and looked more olive color. So your brain can sometimes pull these funny tricks on you when you don't realize the conditions under which you're you're existing. And but as soon as it's it, it takes in all the information, like oh that's in the shade, like the other things are around it. Suddenly it changes your perception, and it's no longer an olive colored uh, sunlit uh, uh, paint, but rather a bright yellow paint that's in the shade. So that's kind of the, the process that we're using when we're looking at these whales and seeing the white turning into a gray on the underside. We don't think it's a gray on the underside and only white on the sides. We know it's white everywhere, but it's just all the shadows. So really neat stuff how the brain works that way, I think, as well. I'm still so fascinated just looking at, uh, at that piece you're currently working on, how, how like my brain is still processing that you're actually doing this on black paper. <laughs> Because the animal conveniently yeah. is black and white. Yeah, There's exactly. Like no shades of gray. It's like literally yeah. just black and yeah. white. Oh, the, the, the saddle behind the dorsal fin is usually a little bit of a shade of gray, but the, for right. the vast majority, it's actually all, yeah, as you say, black and white and sharp edges too. So it's really easy to create a vector image of this animal, I guess. <laughs> um, the, other thing, uh, um, the other thing I wanted to say... Uh, Okay, now it escapes, but that's okay, it'll come back. <laughs> anyway, uh, as you can see, I'm starting to add the shade to the upper surface of the animal. So we're gonna do two things here. The, the upper side is sunlit, right? So it's black, but as we've just been talking about, our perception um, allows us to, you know, our brains, how they function, allows us to, to, to perceive that a black animal, a, an actually black animal, a truly black colored animal, will look grayish on top when it is hit by the sun. This is very close to the surface of the water too. It's like just under the surface. Remember, it's pushing its calf to the surface to breathe. So there's going to be the minimal effects of the, of the water uh, absorbing the redder colors from the spectrum. Uh, and so, in fact, it will be very close to gray uh, rather than sort of a bluish uh, tint. Uh, if it was deeper down, you would see more and more blue colors in these kinds of uh, highlights. But right now, we're we're very close to the surface, so it, the water is almost trans, almost fully transparent um, under those short distances. So, the, as I mentioned, we're doing two things here. One is to add this bit of highlight to the upper surface, um, just kind of a slight amount. You don't want to overdo it because it is a black animal, and even when it's brightly sunlit, it won't go much more than just kind of a light gray. Uh, or even a medium or darker, depending on the lighting conditions. But the other thing that we're going to do, and I love doing this part, is uh, we're going to illustrate what are called caustics. Caustics um, are those dancing lines, curved lines of light that are thrown onto the back of animals and other objects, including the seabed, when they're near to the surface of the water and result from the sun this happens uh, almost in exclusively under brightly sunlit conditions. The result of the sun, the sun's rays, when they penetrate through the water, especially through wavy water, being bent a little bit, refracted, right? And as they're bent, the waves, because they're complex in shape, some angles, some, some wave angles bend the sunlight a certain way, and then some wave angles bend it a different way. So you're getting what's happening, it's a lensing effect. And so some areas, when it's a curved wave, they'll actually it'll focus the light into these bright um, lines and dots on, on surfaces below the surface. <laughs> surfaces below the surface. <laughs> surfaces of other things below the surface of the water. And in between those bright lines, there will be relatively darker areas because there the waves actually um, bend the light away from those surfaces. So you get this, this complex network pattern that's always dancing and changing shape on the surface of objects underwater. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to show those caustics, those lines, and I love working with it. It's also a, a major pain for many artists because getting these, these caustics the right shape is a real challenge. Um, you have to look at many photographs. It's one thing to look at a video of caustics or just kind of in person see them dancing on the surface of an object. But when you see the, the, the um, stills from these videos or if you take photographs, you get certain particular shapes and there's certain shapes that work and other ones that don't. So you can't just put a bunch of parallel lines, for example, and say that works unless you have very parallel waves, in which case that's exactly what would happen. But the ocean surface is 
covered by all kinds of waves. And right away you realize that because these waves can be in different shapes and sizes, the caustic shapes and patterns can vary an enormous amount depending on the weather conditions. Uh, and so what we're going to do is remember that in a calm sea, you almost get no caustics. Uh, in, in these long, low waves of, of um, very nearly calm water, you can get these larger caustics that penetrate deeper but are hardly visible at the surface because they, they focus far, far deeper down. And with very rippling water, just this randomly uh, rippling waves, you can get caustics that are all kinds of different shapes. The size of the wave determines the sort of the size of those caustic um, networks. So I'm gonna, if we focus back again onto the image here, I'm gonna start to show you what's happening. So I'm gonna portray this in a situation where there are a lot of little ripples. ripples. And when an animal breaks the surface and creates those, those concentric circles of ripples, that also creates certain sets of caustics. So now this is before the little whale has hit the surface. So we're not actually going to worry about that right now. But remember that this, this surface is going to have lots of waves, little small waves. So what we're going to do is remember that those ones have uh, lensing effects of various sizes depending on the wave. And they're going to, in our case, they're actually going to uh, focus things into a variety of, of, of patterns, um, relatively sharp patterns onto the back of the whale. And so these caustic patterns, I, I love drawing them, but they are also very challenging as I mentioned. Think of the very different waves in which waves can interact with each other. They're, they come in, they move in all different directions. It's not just that they move in one direction. They're coming in all directions and they're interfering with each other positively to make bigger waves and negatively to make troughs or, or, or smooth water. And then they just kind of pop up all over the place as a result. You're getting waves moving in different directions, hitting each other, and that's what's causing the complexity of the wave um, structure on the surface. And that's what is resulting in the complexity and the specific shape of these caustics on the surface of the animal. So I, I love these kinds of um, optics rules and, and, and trying to use them to, to um, create artwork. And so you, you can draw these lines on the back, but they're curved. Two things, they're curved on their own anyway, but they're also curved because they're going over the curved back of the animal. So we're also implying some of the curvature, the depth of this animal. So you're trying to think in sort of different dimensions. You're trying to portray these, these curved caustics accurately, but also overlaying an additional curvature onto them. So there's going to be this bias of curvature that is kind of like this. But in addition to that, you have these sort of lens-shaped caustics that kind of overlap with each other, and then they kind of twist in different ways as well. And one other thing, when they come down along the side of an animal with a round cross-section, remember that at some point the animal no longer gets sunlight directly on its back, but in fact, um, you start to encounter shadow. And anywhere where there's shadow on the animal, there are absolutely no caustics, ever. Because caustics only result from direct sunlight hitting that spot. Um, bright light, whatever the source of the bright light is, hitting that spot. So shadow is completely free of caustics. Remember that. We never put caustics underneath an animal. And as we near that area where it goes from sunlight to shadow, uh, which is actually somewhere around here, because remember, the black is going to be darker here, even though we have some of the light on top, it still means that sunlight is hitting this side here a little bit, but not much. That means that the black here is looking more black. <laughs> but the caustics go about as far as the sunlight, actually exactly as far as the sunlight does. And when they do, they get stretched. Okay, because now you're projecting a particular network shape onto something that is at a sharp angle. Okay, so now just like with, with our shadows becoming really long near sunset and, and, and at sunrise, those caustics also become longer and stretched out as they go toward the, the point where, the ter what we call the terminator, uh, the, the point where the sunlit area uh, meets the shaded area. Okay? So now we're trying to overlay all of this information uh, in the curvature, the, the sort of the innate curvature, the curvature due to the animal's uh, cross-sectional shape, and the stretching that happens. And the reduction, uh, the, the reduction of the brightness of the caustic as we near the terminator. Okay, so all of this information has to be incorporated for the caustic to look right. Now you understand why it's so difficult to draw caustics that look natural and accurate. Uh, and also, sometimes you have caustics that sort of interact in interesting ways. You'll cross, they cross each other, 
And when they cross each other, remember, because these caustics themselves are a result of interference, or rather lensing, um, by the waves, by water at the interface of atmosphere and, and water on the sun, when they, the caustics meet each other, they, they undergo what's called constructive interference. They add together in brightness. So those intersections are even brighter. So you get these bright points where they cross. Okay? And sometimes they'll cross and then they'll kind, of, they'll kind of go beside the other one and there'll be an area where it's a little bit, little bit brighter. And then now again, remember, we're moving toward the bottom so it gets faded out and stretched. It's so complicated. But this is also why I love doing it because when you get it right, it looks so cool and it adds this level of realism to to images um, and I and this is the, one of the reasons I absolutely love working with um, depicting underwater scenes because you get to play around with these fascinating rules of optics um, and yeah they're challenging but they're also extremely rewarding um, so that's what I'm doing here I'm creating various kinds of caustics and you can see this line here now just connect continues it's just basically the the line of of, um, of the um, the, you know, the, the lens effect of the sun on the surface, but it can also kind of peter out a bit because again, those waves change a lot They're, as they move over, over from one location to another. So the lensing is not at all constant from one location to the other. And what one wave can lens can create this caustic, but this is created by a whole other wave and then it kind of fades out as it reaches the second one. Very complex kinds of things happening here. But again, caustics are really useful. And again, as we get really close to the surface, and the smaller the waves are, the closer together those caustics are. And so you sometimes have waves of different sizes overlaying each other. Uh, and they will be simultaneously present and simultaneously causing caustics. Some of the caustics will be larger and, and blurrier from the bigger waves. Other ones will be smaller and much sharper from the tiny waves that are happening at the same location. And differences in brightness as well, depending on on various other factors. So you get a really complex network of these lines on the back of the animal. Anyway, uh, there, a crash course in, <laughs> in depicting caustics on the backs of animals and other surfaces underwater. And you can start to see we're getting something that resembles what we normally see in life um, near the surface. And people are getting, like, <laughs> people watching this live are getting a good view of a new camera perspective that I've ah, just been yes. Thank you, Marcus. That trying looks awesome. To I love working this way with this. Um, it's called E-Room Repcom. For some reason, it doesn't really, it doesn't work the way it should work. <laughs> I can't, I can't really get the image, but people can still watch from above them, which it, is, it's, 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 really, it's really cool. I love it. Um, because you also remove all of that distortion that happens from a, a camera angle from the side where, you know, the, the stuff nearer to the camera suddenly looks larger. Uh, we don't really want that. I think um, we have the mouse cursor right oh, here. Maybe. We do. <laughs> right yes, around. this is not part of the image. <laughs> <There we go>. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I can chase the cursor around. The other thing to keep in mind, when we're dealing with um, these highlights uh, on the backs of the animal, these caustics uh, behave also differently when you come to narrow edges. So for example, let's look at the, the dorsal fin here. When we switch over to that, I'll wait till. Sorry. No worries. Take your time. I'm just going to work in the other part in the meantime. I'm going to explain that when we're dealing with narrow, um, uh, like almost knife edges, those caustics, again, remember, they only hit areas that are sunlit. Okay? So the side of a fin that's vertically oriented may be in shade by its, its own shade. It might, if it's slightly tilted a little bit away from the sun, it might actually shade itself. And that area that's in shade will have absolutely no caustics on it. Or if it's vertical and, and the sunlight is very, very barely hitting it, then those caustics will be very stretched out, but only on the side. As it uh, curves to the very top edge, and remember any flippers and, and fins are gonna have a thickness. They aren't ever just two dimensional. They'll have a thickness and they have this upper edge that edge will have sharp caustics on it. So here, let's, let's show how this works. So if we look at the, at the dorsal fin, remember, decide which angle your light is coming from. Super important, because uh, which way the sun is coming, because that's going to define the, way, the direction in which caustics stretch. Our sunlight is coming almost directly from overhead here. And the other cool thing about sunlight underwater is that you can only have it go just so, um, tilted just so far, because in air, we can have sunlight from all different directions. You know, at, at sunset and during the golden hour, it gets really low and can be almost fully horizontal. When it transitions between 
the air-water interface. There's a f cool thing that happens. Um, Snell's law applies. Uh, and that has to do with the relative... Sorry, what's that law again? Snell's law. Snell's law. Snell's. S-E-S-N-E-L-L. -S okay. And this guy, <laughs> Snell, came up with this uh, back in... This is sort of in, in, in optics and such. Um, okay, that makes sense. So what ends up happening is you get a different proportion. Uh, when the light, uh, incoming light, hits directly from overhead, basically all of it goes through. Okay? There's no, almost no reflection. Um, there's almost no light. Uh, uh, it's, but this way, when we're looking from below, <laughs> any light coming directly straight down from, from above, uh, if you look at the ocean surface, there's no reflection from below. You're looking right through to the sky. All you see is sky. However, as if you're looking from underneath, and you're looking toward the horizon underwater, there's a point at which you it switches from light transit, transmitting from above to light reflecting off the bottom of the water back at you. So you're going to start to see a, ref, a, a reflection of the ocean bottom or whatever is just below the water surface. It'll become a mirror. At some point, the water becomes a pure mirror. And anything beyond that angle downward, will the, the surface of the water will look like a mirror. But there's a, a transition zone. And that's at about, I think it's about 55 degrees to the normal or the vertical, at which it'll switch from being reflective to transmissive. And uh, it's just a property of water. Uh, and, and, and any particular fluid has a different sort of um, uh, an angle. And it'll, you'll start to see the sky uh, instead of the reflection. So you'll have, if you go underwater, you'll notice that there's sort of this kind of the circle above you uh, of of the, uh, about 55 degrees on each side, where the sky suddenly turns into this reflective bottom uh, reflections. And that's something that's important because no light will be able to go underwater um, from the surface more than that 55 degree angle. Okay, so you can't have light traveling unless it originates from underwater. If it's underwater light, you can have any angles, right? But if it's light coming from the sun, there's a maximum uh, horizontalness <laughs> that this light can be, uh, and that's about 55 degrees. That's an official word. Now. Yes, horizontal. You just coined a new word here. Yeah, you heard it here first, um, and so that's why you have to keep in mind that your sunlight can only, um, I think it's only 55 degrees can 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 be oriented. So keep that in mind. But we're going to have sunlight almost from straight overhead to make things simple. Now back to this dorsal fin. Uh, we're going to have bright, sharp caustics on the top edge and here we have to kind of decide how far apart they're going to be um, and i look at the the ones on that i've set up here and i want consistency so i'm going to have a similar distance between them and not regular there's irregularity okay those are those little bright spots now as it goes from being you know effectively horizontal compared to the surface of the water to vertical like at a right angle those will almost vanish, and there'll be full stretching here. And there's just a teeny, teeny, tiny bit of sunlight hitting the side of this dorsal fin. A little bit more at the front end, because in cross-section, it's not totally flat. It's a little bit lens-shaped. And so a little bit more toward the front, and then it'll kind of vanish toward the back there. Because again, this back part here is, is curved a little bit away from the sun, and it is in full shade. So really funky effects that happen here. Okay? So kind of there can be very, very sharp caustic to the top, and then they change to this really long stretch stuff. That's all we see. And angles of the caustics down here are also very, very, very um, almost vertical. Anything that is normally at an angle. Okay? So really cool things about, about the way that, that light interacts with water. And we would continue that along the back. Now, here, again, at the back here I mentioned we have this uh, saddle shape, uh, and this is kind of gray. So I'm going to it's it's a light gray kind of so I'm going to give it an overall color first an overall tone first sorry color and tone oh my god there's so many fun things I can talk about uh, color when it comes to that and tone so we have tone which is the relative brightness hue which is kind of like the wavelength if, if you define color as pure wavelengths it would be like you know the the red orange yellow and all those right the, the rainbow okay so that's where along the rainbow it is that's hue uh, and then you have saturation, which um, has to do in paint with how um, uh, how pure that color is, how much of other colors are in it. And so you get 
uh, gray, which is fully desaturated, because it has an equal amount of all of the different wavelengths, basically. But color is more complex than that. Um, when you look at a car or anything in the, in the wild, when you look at a whale that, that has this, this, this sort of beigey, yellowy color, what, how do you define that in physics? Well, the, the light that's hitting your eyes, this has to do with, I always get excited about this, it has to do with, uh, with my PhD work in microbiology. I uh, looked at photosynthetic or phototrophic bacteria, which use sunlight, like green plants do, to gain a lot of their energy and, and convert this into chemical energy. So they have these special molecules called pigments that absorb the light, and then they are used to transduce the, the light energy into chemical energy by capturing that, that energy and converting it initially into a sort of an excited electron state. Don't worry about the details of that, but the key is that they can only use colors of light or wavelengths that can effectively excite the electrons in these pigments. And each pigment has a very specific kind of pigment profile or, or wavelength profile of the light that can excite it. And when we, when we um, investigate how the different wavelengths of light affect these pigments and their ability to become excited, we, we can trace out this interesting line uh, and it's what we call an absorbance spectrum. The spectrum, the absorbance spectrum of a pigment, um, including for our eyes, our, our, the cones in our eyes, uh, has a very particular shape. And any different light, any color that we, that we see coming at us will also um, uh, be influenced by the reflectance spectrum or be the absorption spectrum, the, the kind of light that's absorbed by the pigment that that the paint or the surface skin um, uh, uh, molecules define. So certain colors of, uh, is, is, is um, absorbed, say, by like my freckles, which are mostly co composed of melanin, and then they uh, reflect only those lights, uh, those wavelengths of light that weren't absorbed by it. And that light that's coming toward my eyes from the reflected light from my freckles um, has a particular wavelength that that is um, influenced by the source of the light, the, the, the wavelengths of the of the composition of the source of light, as well as what's been removed by the pigments. And so color that we see is actually not necessarily just a single wavelength of light, but it's a whole bunch of different wavelengths put together. So any different pigment that we see, we're seeing a whole bunch of these wavelengths uh, and different proportions. And that's uh, why it's so interesting, so much richness there is in the way in which um, light is perceived by different animals. We have three kinds of cones in our eyes, which are the cells that, that perceive color for red, blue, and green. But there are other animals like birds that have four kinds of cones and they can perceive more differences in light, uh, not, not new colors, but better, distinction between differences of color. And mantis shrimp, can they have, um, what is it, 10 or 12 different cone types? They can distinguish um, light um, so much more efficiently. And they can distinguish light that, that is pure um, much more effectively in certain wavelengths because they have these narrow little um, wavelength uh, regions that particular cones uh, in their eyes are, are effective to, to um, um, uh, Perceiving so really cool stuff there. <laughs> you could talk about that for a whole show in its own self. But anyway, back to the free back. free physics lesson yeah. for everyone. <laughs> and I just want to remind everyone: if you're just only tuning in, you're wondering what is this? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're watching a brand new program called uh, Canvas and Currents. Um, it's a live broadcast that we hope to do at least once a month, uh, and it's featuring Julius Chitney, Dr. Julius Chitney. He is uh, our resident artist, uh, and he's here to teach you stuff about marine mammals and other organisms. Julius is really passionate about anything that's alive. <laughs> if it's plants, he can, he can talk to you about trees. 
Uh, he can talk to me about the smallest, uh, small, smallest organisms. Uh, I'm a biologist at heart, and I just love all kinds of life. So I, I've, I've become really uh, interested in so many different areas. So if you out there, wherever you're watching from, uh, we're streaming to multiple channels today, but we can all see your questions. So if you have any questions that you're sending through the chat or through the comment section, uh, we can see those and we're more than happy to answer them. So please send them through. And if you're wondering what else are we doing here other than teaching you about marine mammals and conservation, uh, Julius is painting. He is an artist. He's a scientific illustrator, a paleo artist. Julius, one of these days, we actually have to show them your dinosaurs. Oh, I know. I got a, quite a few of those, too. Exactly. <laughs> yes, indeed. That's kind of, I guess, most of my career as an artist. I, I work a lot with museums uh, to create murals for them. Um, I work with other scientists, paleontologists mostly, but not ex exclusively. Uh, to create reconstructions of what prehistoric animals would have looked like in life based on the research that these paleontologists have done on their fossil remains of many different kinds. And so uh, paleo art is crucially important to paleontology because that is the means by which we get to convey to the rest of the public what we think these animals actually looked like when they were alive. And so that's what that forms the most of my work, actually. And it's a lot of fun because I work with all sorts of wonderful teams and scientists um, who have these absolutely fascinating discoveries. Uh, if, you, if you see a depiction of a dinosaur anywhere and underneath it, it says artist rendition or something, that's... That, that could be Julius, very likely, actually. actually. There's not a lot of people that are doing this. There, so it's, it's there a are an increasing it's number. A, it's a quite it, small community still. It's, uh, it's small compared to other illustration areas, but it is now at the point where there's so many people that have entered it that at this point, it's really hard to make a living if you haven't already established it. The only reason I can do this right now is because I got into it early enough that there was relatively little competition at the time. Now it's huge. So... I know I get that question a lot of what, what would you recommend for somebody getting into paleo art to start. At this point, I would say the first question you should ask yourself is, are you willing to put an enormous amount of effort into it? And even then, it, it's kind of iffy because there's just so much competition now that you really, 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 really have to work hard. And it is not trivial. I'm having to work harder and harder now because, partly because there's there's just more competition. And you know, that's what it is. It's, it's great, it's a wonderful community, but it's like with any other area, the more people doing it, um, you know, the, uh, unless you have a lot more work available uh, in, in its own right, uh, let's say more museums and so on, or more research, which does sometimes happen, you have to divide that among an increasing number of people, which means that everybody gets a little smaller piece of the pie. Uh, so nowadays, it's really hard to get into it, really hard. Um, but um, I consider myself very, very fortunate to have started earlier on, and now I can do this. And But the other thing that I really enjoy doing is what we're doing here, and using artwork to help promote increased awareness about conservation of the wonderful biology that's around us, of the beautiful animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, archaea, all kinds of living things, this beautiful array of self-sustaining chemical reactions that we call life. And that's absolutely amazing to me. Try, if you will, for a moment, as I keep adding these caustics and you can see what I'm doing here, try to picture, I dare you, to try to picture all of the different chemical reactions that are taking place inside, uh, you know, even like a bacterium or, or your body at once. It is absolutely astounding. I mean, we have billions, trillions of cells in us. Each of those has a complex set of chemical reactions that are taking place in a way that is separated into different parts of the cell even. If you just were able to picture every single cell in your body and what it's doing, what the chemicals it's producing, for example, because that happens differently in different parts of the body, it would be an astoundingly beautiful complex thing. Of course, we can't even perceive, we can't comprehend this because our attention span isn't big enough for that. We could see all of it at once, but we'd never be able to comprehend it at once. It'd be really amazing to have like this life-size image of, of, let's say, a human being showing every cell in their body. So it's a big enough uh, canvas that's you know many, many skyscrapers tall so that you can actually picture individual cells and see all of that at once. And you could fly by it and, and, and at different distances and, and zoom in on those cells and then back away and see entire organ systems or or you know a whole hand or whatever but you know that's the only way you be able to do that effectively as an artist i think for us nerds that's a pretty exciting idea yeah, for, for some people that might be the well, you know the the scene of a nightmare yeah, exactly <laughs> <laughs> well, actually that would be a really cool project to do um illustrate let's say um like a small animal like 
like the uh, the roundworm Sinoid rhabditis elegans, which is a very common one in a lot of biology labs. It's a uh, it's a roundworm that is uh, is a model organism for a lot of different physiological systems when we study them, and it has a very small number of cells. And if you could blow it up large enough in size on a canvas or a gigantic board or whatever to illustrate every single cell on the animal and the whole animal itself, and then you'd have to like run up to it to see the individual cells or in their components or organelles, and then run back away from it, hoping you you know look where you're going so you don't trip on something, and then see the whole organism for itself. That's maybe the best we can do aside from having a microscope to see these individual cells. But you know, it would be kind of fun to do this kind of a project. I never thought of it before. But this is the other reason it's fun to do these kinds of broadcasts, you know, because here we are chatting about this stuff and getting new ideas I've never thought about before. You think about things differently when you are explaining them and chatting about them with somebody. It's fun. <laughs> and we'd like to hear your ideas as well. So if you're watching this, wherever you're watching from, and you have any comments, uh, again, we keep saying this, uh, feel free to let us know at any point. <laughs> Fun question. Have you tried psychic communication with the orcas? <laughs> psychic? Well, I, I, I don't think that we yet have managed to uh, communicate with, with in any way using uh, a direct reading of brain waves, um, even with, with technologies. I mean, we are able to record brain waves and this wonderful complex um, set of um, overlapping signals. But we haven't got to the point yet where we can actually even interpret those into the complex abstract thought and what all of them mean. There was there was an article I read the other day which which said something along the lines of scientists have discovered a way to record dreams and to play oh, them play them back for you. I'm not sure how vivid those images are. If you can play that back, that would be complex stuff. And I I wonder what they have uh, for that. I do know um, I've read a little bit about the fact, and there were some some probably a lot of people in the audience that could say a lot about this. Actually, I'm hoping we get some of the researchers watching as well. But there have been some fascinating studies. Uh, by biologists, uh, marine biologists especially, who are working, and computer scientists teaming up, uh, to try to decipher the language of some cetaceans, or whales and dolphins and porpoises. Uh, we know already, based on some research, that they are able to communicate in complex ways with each other, uh, depending on the species, the level of complexity and, and such differ. But we also know that orcas, for example, have different dialects. Now, uh, the residents, the, the, the three pods, J, K, and L, of the southern resident orcas, each have different dialects from each other. So there will be some kinds of bits of communication that are unique to one particular pod, or like a big over extended family of whales. But there's also some overlap. So some of their communication patterns do overlap between these pods, and they probably facilitate some communication between pods so that they are able to um, cross um, breed between them, which increases genetic diversity, and that's beneficial for a population of, of a species. Um, but then transients, or big, big way, uh, orcas, which also inhabit this, uh, some of the same waters, have a completely different dialect. And I, I don't know, I don't think there's evidence that they can communicate effectively with each other, like the, the southern residents and the, the bigs killer whales. Um, I wonder if that's actually possible or not, but there's some vast differences in dialect apparently between the two. Yeah, if, or substantial. I, I think they just ignore each other. And that's Pretty the other thing. They like, usually like don't. Different species tend to do, right? People and always ask, other, like, what yeah. happens if this species yeah. ever encounters this one? They yeah. probably just ignore each other if they don't have a predator prey relationship. And in fact, transient um, orcas are one of the populations that have been shown to be so distinct genetically from um, most other orcas that they might um, warrant being described as a different species, some of them. Uh, and then you have within the transients even special kinds of differences. So there are like the, um, uh, the oh, what is it, the, um, it's a, uh, oh, sorry, it's the, uh, I'm trying to check my notes here, uh, the, Oh yeah, the outer coast transients. Okay, so for example, there's a a group that that mostly hunt uh, along the margins of um, of uh, the um, continental shelves off the coast of Oregon and California, for example. 
And so those ones um, are, are a subset of the transients. And the transients, uh, I think as a whole, uh, have been shown to be quite genetically distinct from others in some way. So we might actually be looking at a different species there from the southern residents, for all we know. Um, fascinating stuff. For conservationists, that's exciting. If, yeah. we, if we get a split of another species and we get one more, and we usually... <laughs> As conservationists, we're concerned about the opposite happening. So Well, and, and the thing is that uh, sometimes this is really effective in conservation because if you want to protect a particular population, or in this case, one that has a particular culture even, that's distinct from others, uh, it's hard to get um, protection for, like, you, you can... You can work toward getting a particular species listed as endangered or critically endangered or whatever the, the status is defined as, but usually it's harder for populations. And so if, you, if, if we suddenly have a population that is now described as a new species, that increases the odds of being able to get funding and, and policy changes to uh, provide better protection for that population. Uh, so that's another thing. But then, of course, we also have to be careful because now we also run the risk of diluting that effort. Because if you have too many species within a group, now you have to talk about several species for which you need to get um, uh, better protection. And that might also have its own challenges. So there are, I guess, pluses and minuses to that. Um, in the end, the reasons for describing new species are not for getting you know, better um, conservation status. Um, it's, it's because there is, you know, scientific observations that, that support that these, these organisms are, are likely valid different species that don't interbreed with each other typically, not, or at least very, very little. There's interesting differences in different species concepts, but um, overall uh, with mammals, um, it depends on the, <laughs> the type too, it's pretty complicated. But anyway, um, you know, the bottom line is that there seems to be evidence, uh, genetically especially, uh, and otherwise, that there are very likely more than one species of orca in the world. And I think that's really exciting. When you look at the D types, they're especially fascinatingly different. They look like pilot whales, as we talked about before in some ways. Their melon is, is, is more bulbous. Um, it, it, the, the, the head looks more square cut rather than this, this sort of slightly longer beak. They look really different from other orcas, and that's, again, they have almost really no eye spot. That that gives you those, uh, gives you the perspective of uh, both of these being dolphins, right? Exactly. We call them pilot whales. We call them whales, but they're actually also dolphins, just like the killer whales. Exactly. And um, if um, if we want to just kind of uh, hang on, uh, where is it here? Cut back to. I'm going to share again that picture um, of that I'd prepared. Of here we go. Share screen. I'll get this eventually. <laughs> and there it is. Yeah. Um, okay, this one here, uh, which I produced. Uh, oh, my head looks interesting. <laughs> that digital face. Yeah, this one here, um, again, that bottom one is a type D orca. And just look at the difference. This is just the front end. But look at the difference in the eye spot size. And also that, that shape of the, of the head and the melon being more square uh, and, and smaller uh, proportional beak. So yeah, that's a very different looking animal than the others even. But then there are differences genetically among the others as well. So anyway, really funky stuff. Um, I want to talk about something else that's of interest here. Uh, we mentioned this a little bit before. There is a population of orcas um, near the Iberian Peninsula, uh, the Iberian orcas, uh, that have kind of made their way into the news a lot in the last couple of years. These are the ones that have been um, observed um, uh, damaging yachts in the area. So uh, there are only about 35 of them in this population. And there are about 11 of them, I think, that are actively engaging in this activity. And, um, oh, sorry, 11 or 15? It might be 15. I actually think it's 15. Uh, I think it's 11 juveniles and four adults, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, uh, they've been known to do a variety of things to some of the yachts in the area, from ramming them with their nose to even like sometimes biting the hull. But most often what you see is they will start to play, it looks like play, with the rudder of the boat. And they'll start nudging it back and forth. Now, what on earth is happening here? Now, this all seemed to start uh, and, and maybe be caused by hard to say, uh, there, there was apparently some traumatic uh, interaction between a, a, an orca and a yacht at some point, a boat of some sort. And um, it, I think it may have resulted in 
in some sort of potential defensive behavior on the part of the orca, uh, especially toward youngsters. And since then, we've seen an increase in the number of these kinds of interactions between orcas and boats, where they seem to be deliberately harming the vessel. Nobody's actually, nobody's been killed, nobody's been harmed. But the boats have actually sustained some damage. Some of them have actually sunken due to um, bits of the hull um, sustaining enough damage to cause water to start flowing in. Um, if in fact it's being, if, if in fact this is kind of a defensive thing, uh, then there is a very simple way to counteract it. And it may be resulting from one researcher actually suggested that this might be a way for the whales to be attempting to disable the boat in the same way that, they dis that predators often disable prey by biting at the tail, which prevents it from being able to swim effectively. And they may be seeing the rudder or the, uh, of the ship as something analogous to the tail, and they might be biting at it for that reason. If that's the case, then the best way to counteract this is just, and they've suggested, just stop the boat. If the whales, if the orcas are approaching a boat in this area, if you see it and you're going in a boat there, just turn off the engine, stop the boat, and they, they stop doing this. It's when the boat is moving that they're trying to uh, uh, disable it, it seems, which is really interesting what's happening there. The other thing is that some researchers, like um, Monica Gonzalez was one of them, uh, a marine biologist in the area, had mentioned that a lot of this behavior more resembles play behavior. And more interesting than that, uh, orcas exhibit, as I mentioned before, uh, cultural uh, behaviors, a certain and distinct cultural types of um, sets of behavior, including what looked like fads. So for a while, and this is something that she had actually described, there was a, uh, a population that started to uh, effectively like wear dead fish on the tops of their heads and carry them around almost like we would see as hats and this became a fad it several whales started to do this and they would copy each other and it's, it's like a fashion trend among us and then eventually it kind of got old and they stopped doing it and it, there's been the idea suggested that maybe this is kind of a similar fad maybe that this playing with the rudder and unfortunately they're large animals so they can damage it this might actually also pass so again we have to keep in mind this uh, i worry for the whales because whenever it comes to interactions between animals and, and humans or our possessions, more often than not, if there's a conflict, it's the animals that begin, uh, end up getting the short end of the stick. There are policies that often are created that end up harming the animals uh, in some way, and that's really unfortunate. I hope we can overcome that kind of behavior on our part. And let's be careful, let's be wise. If we see orcas approaching a boat, and again, never approach an orca in a boat, we have laws uh, in many places that, that completely prohibit this, including here in Canada. What is the limit now? Is it 400 meters, the closest we can approach? It depends on the species, yeah. Okay. If it's, yeah, I think 400 is the, for the mm -hmm. southern resident killer mm -hmm. whales, and we have different, different limits okay. depending on what. I think the minimum for any marine mammal is 100 meters. Okay. So even if you're encountering a harbor seal or a sea lion, you got to stay at least 100 meters away. And for, for animals like seals and sea lions, people sometimes just ignore those rules because they think these animals are not as important but there's actually rules prohibiting you from making that animal move from causing it to to leave its hollowed spot or something that that's up to uh, there's huge fines for that kind of yeah. behavior. and sometimes i don't know is, is there any potential jail time in some situations i know that in some serious harassment the, I, I i would hope there's some serious repercussions i'm um, not sure maybe if we can't pay the fine <laughs> maybe the fines at least um yeah so again it's it's just common sense uh let's avoid harassing animals you know we don't we don't like it when they harass us sometimes except that, i mean i love to be approached by some animals I, and but you know it's we all love some, yeah. Any, uh, just could be <laughs> any a animals, spider. Yeah, oh hell, heck yes, absolutely. But, um, but we let's respect them. Let's. They want to do their thing. They don't want us coming around because remember when, as Marcus pointed out very rightly, when they have to move from their roost from wherever their hole out, that takes energy. They're doing that for a reason. They're laying there often to recharge their energy, to get sun, um, to warm up so that they don't get cold in the water, so they can hunt more efficiently, so that they can raise their babies more efficiently. Sometimes they're pregnant, they need certain foods. Let's not disturb them while they're eating for that reason as well. Good example of some of the, the great white sharks um, that were disturbed recently, a few years ago, uh, by groups of people who were interested in, in watching them from very close up while they were feeding on whale carcasses at the surface of the water. Turned out that at least one of those uh, sharks was pregnant. And these 
whale carcasses are crucially important for them to gain the energy they need to be able to sustain their um, fetuses in their bodies. And so by disturbing them, by and, and, it, and it was shown that the, the sharks ended up spending less time feeding when there were a larger number of people around. So there's evidence that we are disturbing them in some situations, especially let's not harass them because they need this food, they need these conditions they're in to be able to survive best. So this is something we can actively do by just getting out of their way. If they come toward us, that's different. Just be passive, um, don't try to in engage them, but you can watch them if they come close to you and just revel in the experience, but just don't approach them, don't follow them, don't swim with them, don't jump in the water with them, don't motor don't toward them. Don't feed them. Don't I feed them. I think yep. that's, that's true for <laughs> just, just about any wild animal you could encounter, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Whether it's coyotes yep. or uh, right. any kind of Good whale, dolphin, marine mammals, yep. of course, but land mammals too, just leave them alone. Yep. It's generally generally a good idea. It's, it's a really good point, actually, because with things like coyotes, um, you know, uh, predators, we shouldn't feed them as well because um, that increases their chance of expecting more meals from humans. And other people that have not fed them, don't have food, the coyote may harass them because they expect that from them because others have shown this example. We don't want that to be happening because, again, as we saw here in Vancouver as well, coyotes were killed when they showed too much aggression towards humans because others had fed them. So really sad example, but a very poignant one. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to show you your artwork just yep, while we're talking. We go. I'm going to read out a few more comments that we've, we've got online. Uh, Mika, for instance, says, uh, it's pretty incredible how dangerous uh, they are to so many sea oh, animals, yes, 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 uh, but they've never harmed oh, a human. I love this. I in love the wild. this. I mean, we talked about this earlier today, oh, right? This is, this is something I wanted to talk about next anyway. So thank you, uh, Nika. Uh, I think so. Yeah, Mika yeah, thank, Blue 420. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> That's great. I, this is a fascinating area, and it, it, it totally blows me away. So orcas are probably maybe the one of the the top apex predators okay sperm whales maybe they're bigger uh, they hunt uh, a giant squid in the depths fascinating area we have to do a put uh, a show on those too um, anyway uh, orcas yeah top predator in the oceans really really powerful take down baleen whales in packs but there is and I looked through this carefully there is maybe one uh, well-documented, reputed ex account of an orca biting a human in the wild. And the reason for that is probably mistaken identity. This was a surfer in turbid water. It was 1972. Um, his name was Hans... Um, uh, what was it? <laughs> oh, I had it in the notes. Hans... Uh, We're looking this up. Kretschmer. Julius is a scientist, so he <laughs> needs to know this kind of thing. Yeah, Hans Kretschmer in September 9th, 1972. His uh, board got bitten and he got some uh, um, a bite that required some stitches. But this was a young orca based on the size of the bite, and it was turbid conditions, so it was probably mistaken identity. What's really remarkable is that over the thousands and thousands of interactions between orcas and humans, that is the only reputed example of a wild one attacking a human, and it didn't kill him, it let go, it was probably mistaken identity. In the wild, they seem to make a point of being gentle with us. I don't know why, it's amazing, but they do. They're remarkably uh, gentle with us, remarkably unaggressive with humans. The examples that we see of orcas ever attacking humans are in captivity, under extremely stressed conditions. Orcas being kept in these small tanks, these are ocean-going animals that require thousands of kilometers of linear distance sometimes, or at least hundreds, to survive, to hunt. They're, imagine being in solitary confinement effectively, or at least a very small jail cell. You can't even walk outside, because if you're an orca, you're a marine mammal, you can't walk around outside. You're completely shut off from anything. It's worse than, than a prison, because you're effectively disconnected from the rest of the world, because there's nothing in which you can even walk through after that. So under these stressful conditions, it is sometimes it sometimes does happen that animals will become aggressive toward keepers. And that has happened on some occasions, but relatively few considering even. In the wild though, they simply don't attack us. This doesn't mean we should harass them or, or, or have use this as kind of like, oh, you know, this is a, a, a free ticket for, for getting close to them. No, because again, it's also for their own good that we want to protect them, to keep us uh, ourselves away from them. But the amazing thing is that how 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 gentle they are with us. In fact, on one of my cruises, I've taken a couple of, um, actually three 
deep ocean hydrothermal vent cruises during my PhD, uh, where we, um, <laughs> it was fun, <laughs> we went out on three research uh, expeditions on large research vessels to these areas of um, volcanic spreading centers on the bottom of the ocean, where you have these hot um, uh, water spewing out and, uh, and causing all these really amazing communities of biology to, to um, uh, exist these hydrothermal vent communities. And on their way back, uh, we sometimes see uh, like dolphins riding the bow wave of the of the ship, which is amazing to see. Pacific white sided dolphins in that case. Uh, and they're particularly see... acrobatic. Oh, they're, they are. They, they love to ride the bow wave of ships. So you'll see them there just playing around because it's a free ride almost. It's like water being pushed. And so they don't have to put as much energy into their swimming. So they love to play around in the bow wave. Uh, but on the way back on one case, uh, we were transitioning from the main research vessel via a, um, a Coast Guard vessel. Canada Coast Guard vessel brought us to the coast. And then when we transitioned, when we moved from the Coast Guard vessel to the shore, we used a small rubber dinghy. And this was in um, uh, the Port of Alberni, or P Port Alberni, that we did this when we landed. And at the time, and unfortunately this little whale has since passed, but there was an orca that was hanging out. It was a young female orca that was um, hanging out in that fjord. And I think the idea was that it may have gotten lost from its pot. Uh, and it was becoming very friendly. And of course, that's a danger. And I think ultimately it died because of a sh shipping strike, if I'm not mistaken, like a ship strike. Um, but what I will always treasure is this experience of, uh, of going in the dinghy and having this little orca show up around and the orca was pushing up the sides of the dinghy and playing with it, basically, very gently. It never was a, a threat to us. Uh, but it was really amazing to... That was the closest I've ever been to an orca, and it was something that was spectacular. It's sad, because the reason uh, that that orca became so, um, so friendly is because it was lost from its pod. And um, I suspect that other people were especially friendly to it, and maybe there was feeding, I don't know. But we need to allow animals to distance themselves from us. So when we are engaged, for example, in helping um, to uh, uh, raise and then re-release animals uh, that are rescued from the wild because they are orphaned or injured, we have to try our best to try to reduce our interaction with them uh, in a way that the animals don't learn that humans are a great source of treats or just friendly and you know they pet them and so on we want animals to remain wild so when we release them they'll be able to exist in the wild and not approach humans because unfortunately when they approach humans there are situations in which uh, we don't respond um, a very in very friendly ways and sometimes they're shot sometimes they just uh, it, it encounter boats and they get run over by the boat or, or they get lacerations from the propeller or um, or they just um, become what some people call a nuisance and are having to be moved away or in some cases even killed and this is what we want to avoid we want to avoid harming wildlife and to do that we need to invest an effort of keeping them wild to try to reduce that chance that they're going to see us as something that they want to hang out with it's beautiful to experience close contact with wildlife, but only on their terms when they do it naturally. Because animals are curious, naturally. And often they will in the wild anyway approach boats or, or people swimming. And, uh, and even then, I think it's important to, to remember that we should keep those interactions to a minimum because exactly. even if they do approach you yeah. you shouldn't like yeah. you know don't try to touch it exactly. I, mean, I, I can see how the temptation is there but don't do it because yeah. exactly. generally if, if they lose that natural shyness and an wild animals yeah. tend not to approach humans unless they're a squirrel maybe but <laughs> cetaceans for them that would be curiosity at best but they would probably avoid boats yeah. uh, but if they do approach you um it's it, like you said earlier, right? It's 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 just about respect. To just give yeah. them their space. Be passive. Just uh, that, that's the, the key thing to remember is when an animal approaches you in the wild, be passive. Don't reach out to them. Don't try to encourage the interaction. See what they do. Um, you know, if it's a situation where they are potentially a threat to you, like maybe I don't know. I mean, bears also have a, a very uh, unnecessarily negative reputation. But in a situation where there are some large predators, it is best to do our best to try to. Remove ourselves from that situation so that we don't increase the chance of a negative encounter. Uh, and if we can't, then at least let's be uh, in such a way we don't encourage interaction necessarily. There are a lot of them that are safe around us, like I'm saying orcas are incredible. 
that way. But we don't want to encourage them to hang out with humans. Uh, just don't reach out to them, don't feed them, be passive when it comes to these kinds of encounters, and just enjoy a curious animal on its own terms, but don't go and seek it out by swimming toward them or you know, approaching them. These are things that I know we shouldn't have to be saying, but they do need to keep being said because of the number of times that we see this kind of a thing happening. So we need to reach a larger audience of people that way. You can see here I've started to um, notice how the animal's body curves, right? Remember how I talked about the stretching of these caustic marks, um, the, 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 the caustics that result from the refraction of sunlight through the surface waves? Well, they stretch down as they approach a more vertical surface, and that also happens on the animal's back as it curves downward. Right, so if I were to line this up, <laughs> I've got this turn as I'm working on it. But if you're watching this at home, this is the way. This is right side up now. Okay, so the animal its nose is pointed toward the surface. Oops, sorry, there we go. Whoop, whoop, whoop. I'm trying to think in reverse. Oh, yeah, here we go. We can do. It. Yeah, I see. <laughs> well, we, we go with this. Its shot, nose yeah. is pointed toward the more toward the surface, but um, hang on. I'll see sure. There we go. That's right side up. <laughs> and here, the animal's back is curving downward. So those caustics are being stretched even on the back of the animal. Okay? So that's another thing to keep in mind to make caustics look as accurate as possible. And what I'm doing now is, is coloring in the white patch that is this underside, sort of this inverted saddle underneath the belly of the animal, one of those distinctive marks. Oh, by the way, it's not a mark that is completely distinctive to orcas. There are other dolphin species, some of which also possess a similar uh, mark to this belly mark. Um, oh my goodness, what is the name of that one dolphin in the Southern Oceans? Um, Julius, there's 97 or 98 <laughs> different species in that order. Yeah. I have, that's I've illustrated a book many. on them actually. Um, <laughs> that was, it was really fun because I got to illustrate every single species of cetacean known basically, it was fun. It's super fun. I have a copy of it, don't I? You, you gave do. me okay. a copy, yeah. yes. Yeah, so there you go. Um, but there are some dolphins that have a similar looking patch like this, but none of them have this big white eye spot like orcas do. That's something that is distinctive to orcas. So if you see this combination of, of, of color, these markings, you've got an orca. Uh, and, and it's just spectacular to see them uh, in the wild from a distance when you see them surfacing. Oh my goodness, the, you know, they have the, the characteristic spray that they emit from their uh, blowhole when they exhale the, the spent air in their lungs. And you know, there's some whale snot that's expelled with it. That's a lot of what that, that spray is. <laughs> so next time you see it, you're looking at a lot of whale snot, basically, or, or you know, like liquid from within the whale's respiratory tract, basically. But yeah, it's kind of like yeah, we like to kind of joke about it as like whale snot. But it's 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 also a really neat way to learn about the the composition of a whale's breath if you're able to sample that and i think some researchers have done this to learn about the health of the whales and such i i, uh, I get a lot of questions about uh buoyancy and how they do this they actually exhale before they dive right they, they don't sense, do it like yes. we do they do it the to opposite some extent around. right right i mean there's going to be some um, air left inside anyway but that's a good point exhaling when you go down is important so that you don't float so well because of all the air in your lungs uh, so if you want to really dive deep, you need to exhale some of your air uh, so that it doesn't require as much paddling to get down there. So at some point there will be this balance between the energy required to paddle downward, balancing out with the uh, with the the, the, lo the lost buoyancy of, of, of expelled air, uh, and you know whatever. <laughs> I'm not a diver, but I can see how that could might work. Uh, can I talk about? Um... Because you're a biologist, I'm gonna have you talk about this. I'm probably gonna screw this up if I try. Um, they have a unique way of storing oxygen in their oh, tissues in a way oh that's goodness, very, that's very, right. very different of how that works for us. That's why I they can hold their breath for so long. That's a good point. Actually, you know what? You caught me at something that I know less about for... for no way. Here. Do you know more about this? Because you actually probably do know more about this <laughs> no, than me. Probably not. Um, is it, is it uh, have to do with the way in which uh, it binds to hemoglobin? It, oh my I, I, the only thing that I do know that is that they store that oxygen in their tissues, uh, okay, particularly okay. their muscle tissues, okay, okay. and that's that's obviously very different. Of oh, this how is something I should have checked out more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, but that's interesting. That that's the thing. These animals that live in different environments than you and I do, walking on the surface, have these spectacularly evolved adaptations for for 
existing so well in those environments for existing underwater for so long I mean, sperm whales can hunt for like an hour underwater almost for the, at the bottom of the ocean in these deeper areas that are like what is it like several hundred meters at least or a thousand or more meters yeah really amazing orcas can dive to a depth in some cases of it is it like 1200 meters deep that's incredible. Really, <laughs> just just if you think about the time, how long it takes to get down to yeah. that depth. Yeah. I mean, that's I think the maximum, um, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah. they they have been uh, seen taking fish off long line, um, uh, uh, like fishing lines at those set at those depths. So really amazing how deeply they can dive sometimes. I'm gonna switch back uh, to showing you uh, as you're uh, drawing this orca. Uh, I want to point towards that tiny orca at the nose uh, tip yeah, right. of that <laughs> adult <laughs> yes. animal. There's just, not a on it. <laughs> just because you, you, were, you were talking earlier yes. about uh, that energetically free ride that they get when they bow ride. Um, that's, that's sort of very similar of how, how a baby, uh, baby orca would uh, do the same thing, right? When they're, when they're swimming behind uh, oh, yeah. the flipper along, alongside the mom. That's, that's neat, isn't it? Yeah, exactly, because... Uh, bow waves or bow waves are created not just by ships but by anything traveling through the water near the surface so if they're at the surface or basically this, this could apply at different depths as well uh, any object moving through the water will trail some of the water along with it near its uh, near the surface of the skin for example right so um, anything and, and this is where it's so cool when you look at, at pilot fish and 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 remoras um well remoras are actually attached to whatever host they have like sharks for example but it's also true that fish traveling very close to and in this case baby whales traveling closer to the mothers are larger larger moving objects in the water get a bit of an energetic bonus because some of that water near the surface of the animal is trailing along with it is moving as well so swimming through that moving water means you have to put less effort into moving um, yourself. So you're getting a bit of a free ride there. It's just like with bow waves of, of a boat pushing the animal along, uh, anything near an animal, especially one like, okay, animals like these like are, are hydrodynamically beautifully shaped so that they minimize drag. They minimize the amount of water they have to trail along. But it's never perfect. No animal is hydrodynamically perfect. There's always going to be a little bit of drag. And that bit of drag is what others around them can use to basically s kind of get a little bit of an energy boost and not having to put as much energy into uh, paddling along. In the, in the case of baby whales, traveling right next to their mother would be a way of, of gaining a bit of this energetic advantage. They're small. They don't have as much uh, energy reserves as the mother. So anything they can use is, is helpful for them. I'm just going to go back to the comments as I show you. As you're drawing this little baby. Yeah, uh, so the baby. This is the newborn baby. Uh, you could imagine, like, you were talking about this sad scene earlier where the mom was pushing the baby to the surface, yeah. the animal that had already deceased. But they yes. also do this with, uh, for instance, a newborn uh, mm. a newborn animal. Like, a bunch of different species of cetacean will do this right after birth. They may give it a little bit of a, a push to get up to the yeah. to the surface to take that first breath because they uh, don't have gills like fish yeah they need to get up there otherwise they'll drown right and as soon as the blood supply from the from the umbilical cord is cut now that little baby needs to go to the surface to breathe right away as much as it can because that's where it's going to get all of the rest of its oxygen so yeah the mothers will often of several species will go and and nudge their babies um, bellies and push them up to the surface to help them to get up there to breathe because without oxygen first in their lungs they don't have as much buoyancy so any bit of a push to get them to the surface will help them to get there without expending so much energy because they're, they're they're they've just kind of been born it's probably a tragic a very traumatic experience the first really traumatic experience for them any kind <laughs> of a help they can get to get their first breath is great and then they so that's what mothers do in this case they're wonderful moms and they will help their little kids to get up to the surface to take their first breath yeah i mean they only have one baby every time right. so there's only one to take care of and they, they do a great job doing that. Uh, I'm just going to try and uh, read out some of the questions. Mm -hmm. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to show you a, a close up of uh, Julius as he's drawing that. Uh, yeah, you can see I'm using that kind of a curvature of lines. <laughs> there are so many comments. Um, uh, where do I start? <laughs> um, this is good. This is great. There's one comment, I like this, it's a two-part comment uh, by Bonspree, who said, I think more movie representations where respecting this space oh, might yes. be nice. 
uh, rather than romanticizing writing them. Oh, definitely. Yes. Good comment. Yes, yes, yes. That's true. Um, this has happened in, I don't remember which movies, but yeah, a lot of this interaction between humans and animals in movies, it is romanticized, this, this close contact of one form or another. And whereas, you know, it makes for a great uh, plot, we really don't want to take that away into real life. We don't want to, uh, to be interacting closely with animals in a way that, that harms or harasses them. Uh, so yes, you're absolutely right. I fully agree. We need to at least have uh, a little bit more respect, especially in, in, you know, in, in movie portrayals as well, so that people don't get the idea that, oh, I can do that too. That's right. Uh, uh, oh, this, that's an interesting bit morbid question, but uh, the, <laughs> we, take uh, we take biology questions. <laughs> yes. uh, this question, is it true that orcas explode when they die because of all the built up gases? So I guess that applies oh, to a, any species right. of whale, especially those large whales, uh, yeah. if, if they strand those deceased yeah. animals, right? That's true. Um, some of them, especially, I'd, I've never read about an orca. Explode it. I never, I've not never heard of a killer whale either. Yeah. No, but there are definitely um, cases where uh, the, the like this is again this is microbiology as well. So I mean, once an animal dies and it starts to decompose, decomposition occurs because microorganisms are starting to feed on the now uh, the tissues that are now not protected by its immune system. Right, the immune system is gone. Now there's a, a free lunch for all the various microbes from bacteria to fungi and whatever else kind of will feed on them and, and small myofauna, smaller animals as well, like tiny little animals that are microscopic or nearly so. Um, when this happens inside an animal, uh, these bacteria especially uh, will, will feed on certain kinds of substrates or certain kinds of uh, chemicals. Uh, different kinds prefer different types of chemicals from glucose to various fatty acids and so on. Their byproducts, the end products of, of that metabolism of using these kinds of uh, substrates will often be some other kind of a chemical and sometimes these chemicals are gaseous uh, at our temperatures and pressures. And when that happens, you get a buildup of those byproducts of metabolism inside of the animal because these bacteria are locked away inside the animal in these anaerobic or oxygen-free environments often. And that builds up these gases and the gases don't have any, anywhere to go, but the cavities within the animal, like the, the guts, uh, like the, 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 what were functional intestines and, and stomach and various um, gastrointestinal uh, components or other cavities that form as a result of decomposition. And at some point, <laughs> there is enough gas produced that the, 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 the decomposing skin, the, the skin of the animal that is now less strong than it was in life, simply can't hold up against that internal pressure and it can explode. And this, this has happened in, in several cases. Yeah, which is why usually when they have uh, one of these large uh, cetaceans stranded, like a deceased animal, they usually, they usually prevent people from approaching for that exact what? same reason. It might be, <laughs> you don't want to get caught up in that. Oh my goodness, that'd be strange. Uh, yeah, and really bad smelling. Because really. <laughs> imagine, yeah, decom decomposition is really nasty smelling. And, and so now you would have something that explosively releases these gases in one shot, it would be overpowering. Um, so, you know, aside from the force, anyway, yeah, you're right, it is morbid, but it's an interesting area of microbiology as well. It's fascinating, and it yeah. creates new ecosystem, um, new, new forms of, of energy for ecosystems. Whale falls are amazing. That's where whales die at sea, lose their buoyancy, and the carcass falls to the bottom after it's, you know, some, some soft parts have been eaten by sharks and other animals, and it sits on the bottom. And down here, it is um, taken apart by a variety of animals. Um, so their fish, uh, sharks, and rays will eat the, the soft parts. And then all that's left are the bones eventually. But those bones are rich in, uh, in um, sulfur-containing lipids and so on as well. And so what happens is that there are bacteria that start to break these down and they release uh, what are called reduced sulfur compounds, um, kind of like hydrogen sulfide. And so you have these fascinating communities that release these, uh, like rotten egg smell, that's often these reduced sulfur compounds, that's what's responsible for that smell. And because of that, there are animals that harbor internal symbiotic bacteria that live alongside them in close association with them that are able to use these expelled reduced sulfur compounds 
to then convert this back to oxidized ones as a result. It's a completely balanced, it's, it's, it's the reverse of that metabolism effectively that, that releases them first from the bones, effectively the reverse. And they support communities of microbes and the animals that often um, uh, are symbiotic with them to generate these fascinating communities at whale falls that strongly resemble those that we have at hydrothermal vents, which are also very rich in reduced sulfur compounds, but those reduced sulfur compounds are being emitted from deep within the earth um, and are often, some of them may be generated by microorganisms, some of them are uh, due to um, the, the, the chemistry inside of the earth. So really neat example of how whales contribute to communities of biology at the bottom of the ocean that resemble ones that are, uh, that, that are completely different in their source. And well, this is so fascinating. We're talking about so many things. I think we've covered physics. <laughs> uh, we've talked about the smallest animals and the largest or some of the largest animals that we have in our waters here. Um, I'm really curious now whether we should uh, one have an episode where we actually bring a light microscope here Ooh, and uh, show that yeah, on nice screen. Idea. Talk about talk about some that. of those very small organisms. Yes. Um, and now I'm thinking we should even have a veterinary pathologist uh, oh, so on as a guest yeah. to, to talk about that because we Agreed. covered that as well. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna cut back to uh, to your drawing. Here we are. The You're baby is still working along. on the baby. Mm -hmm. I'm getting um, most of the white on it. And meanwhile, you're going to check out the, the comments? <laughs> yes, <laughs> there are so many comments. Excellent. Uh, I actually can't read this language. I'm not sure what this is. Um, mm -hmm. Looks like, I don't know, what does people speak in Indonesia? Maybe I'm okay. getting this You know what, I'm actually not. I'm sure the name of it. Um, there are probably several many languages, I'm guessing. Uh, at least they're saying I actually want to be a, mar a marine biologist, mm -hmm. and this channel is one of my favorite channels. <laughs> Glad to awesome. hear that. Um, I wanted to give you this. Is, it's a it's a dangerous question to pass okay. on to uh, to Julius because of <laughs> of his many dangerous. passions. Uh, <laughs> there is there's so many different groups of animals that he cares about. I mentioned that earlier. He's got how many how many different plant species do you have at home? Uh, well, not necessarily species, but a lot of horticultural varieties as well and species. I haven't actually done a recent enumeration, <laughs> but I think it's over 400 still. Um, so my place That's is basically crazy. like, um, it, it's like a rainforest in many ways. I, and, and I love having it around. <laughs> so. <laughs> I wonder whether we're going to see new species uh, or, or just different varieties evolve uh, of, of yeah. all the different <laughs> organisms that are hanging out uh, on your plants at home. Probably. I know you're talking about the spiders a lot. That oh, you, yeah, yeah. That I have, have spider residents in there. I'm happy with them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so get back to this yes. <laughs> to this dangerous question because this one was uh, this one was actually I'm going to show you uh, drawing again. I'm I am way too boring, so this is more interesting. <laughs> no. um, there was a question about one of your favorite species. Come on, where is it? There's so many of them. Um, oh yeah, here. Why do sharks? get a bad reputation oh, when they're God. just the puppies of the sea. They I, are, I know you're going to like this they description. They are the puppies of the sea. They're, they're one of the puppies of the sea. There's so many sea puppies. I love sea puppies. Um, yeah, that, you know, I love the fact that I love the way this question was framed, too, uh, because it, it assumes accurately <clears throat> that sharks are far less uh, aggressive and dangerous than than the reputation that they've undeservedly uh, attained over the years. Uh, and so many species are completely harmless. The vast majority are completely harmless. Most of them are actually really, really small, cat sharks and dogfish and so on. And then even the ones that have been historically termed man-eaters, uh, I hate the term. Uh, <laughs> I also hate the term uh, shark-infested waters. They're not infesting anything. They're living there. It's like, they're you know, human cities are human-infested. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, I love the fact that, that you've uh, sort of Frame this question uh, by assuming that in fact they're 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 much nicer than than, than many people give them credit. On. I like that. Thank you. Um, why do they get this bad reputation? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And yeah, I mean there are it's think, people it's that get attacked. Like, it's not things like shark week. That's the you thing. Know, where so we, where that's we're trying exactly. To yeah. Focus on the sensational. Yeah. The big picture. Look at the big picture, right? So, yeah, people do sometimes get attacked by sharks. It happens. They're large predators. It's going to happen sometimes. But look at the proportions, look at the numbers. There are, on average, roughly five people killed by sharks every year. That's enormously tiny. That is <laughs> infinitesimal by all shark species. 
all over the world. That's like it's ridiculously tiny. Statistically, probably more probable that uh, you're going to hit your head on the phone that's floating above your head, and you're going to get you're going to die exactly. from some kind of kind of uh, aneurysm or something. Yep. Yep. Definitely happening more frequently. Absolutely, and and so that's the thing. But so that's the real picture. But we do get a lot of um, spreading of the fear, partly because uh, of lack of knowledge, right? So lack of knowledge is what fuels most fear probably in the world, I think, whether it be xenophobia or, or any kind of fear of animals that is often undeserved. Uh, we just talked about how orcas are incredibly gentle in the wild, how, how little they actually do harm to us. So that's a useful knowledge in any case. But sharks too. They're most of the times, I mean, and I've swum with sharks, it's a beautiful experience. Uh, when you see these, these three top deadly sharks that are often tooted as, as, as man eaters, like the great white, the, the, the tiger shark, and the bull shark, these are, have been historically thought of as really, really dangerous. There are a lot of the time people swim with these, and they're, I mean, I, I'm not saying to harass them. I'm saying they go into the waters where they are often uh, found, and those sharks will come and just kind of check you out, because sharks are curious too. And they will swim around, and it'll be, it'll be often completely safe. It's just that there's this impression of sharks being aggressive eating machines, and it's inaccurate. It's fueled partly by Jaws in some ways. The movie Jaws <laughs> did a lot of damage to sharks' reputations. Uh, and also, because for great whites, the reason we see these kinds of violent-looking attacks is because people throw chum in the water to attract them in the first place. That's going to elicit a feeding response. Blood in the water, pieces of fish. Well, yeah, <laughs> they're going to respond to that. Um, without that, they're a lot safer. Um, and then you have, unfortunately, some of the, the recent programs. I am not a fan of some series of documentaries that have gone more in the direction of Oh, some of the popular topics like, you know, uh, sharks as dangerous, uh, voracious, uh, you know, denizens of the sea sort of thing. I think we need more programs showing them for what they really are. They're always around us. You look at drone footage, for example, which was only recently more available with the development of drones. And if you take a drone far above the ocean and see, a, you know, a beach area that is inhabited by people and there was a lot of swimmers in the water, you find so many sharks around them. The people are unaware of them because you can't see underwater at a distance at an angle. But most of the time, the sharks are actually there. And if you look at from a drone and see from above, you see tons of sharks around people. They're not bothering the people. They're just hanging around in their environment. And sometimes they're curious. They come close. People usually don't even know they're there. And then they'll swim away after they're satisfied. So what happened to me in New Caledonia when I, sw uh, I was um, snorkeling in the lagoons. Beautiful. And I was in a reef area, and this beautiful black tip reef shark female, about two meters long, I just saw in the distance start to appear in the shallow water and slowly did this circle around me about 10 meters away. And she was satisfied with me not being somebody who was, you know, you know trying to take her resources or whatever. I don't know. Hey, she just swam away or whatever, and just that's it. And sometimes they come back, they check you out again. They're just curious. But it was so beautiful to see that. Uh, anyway, so again, sharks get a, a undeserved negative reputation, I think, partly because of the spread of unfortunate misinformation about them and the lack of understanding. This is where um, any kind of advocacy that we can do for you know, uh, educational outreach is going to be super helpful to, to show people how amazing sharks are. In fact, I um, work closely with another group called Sharks for Kids. It's another conservation organization with whom I've actually done several uh, drawing webinars as well. Really love their work. Uh, they are they send sort of uh, education ambassadors around to various schools to help show kids uh, more accurate information about sharks. And I cannot overstate how helpful and how inspiring I see this kind of activity. We need more of this kind of activity from those of us who have any kind of, you know, from scientists who are um, you know, have expertise in certain areas. I love this. I love it. The person asking the question, by the way, earlier, uh, they told me they were Korean. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was Korean. Oh, Apparently, excellent, I'm, excellent. I'm, <laughs> I do not uh, know any Korean. I'm sorry. Um, what else did I have there? I've heard cows harm more people than sharks yeah. do. <laughs> right. Right. I, 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 yeah, I can imagine that. Many animals kill a lot more people than, than, than sharks do. Not to say that those other animals are except, exceptionally aggressive either. It's just 
there are going to be deaths due to various sources and sometimes you know an animal will accidentally lay on a person that can happen <laughs> too it, it doesn't mean it's intentional i'm pretty um, sure we could look this up and we would find like i don't know pigs kill more people uh, than sharks i'm pretty sure Actually, like yeah, whenever it, you have animals so. that are like close to people that people yep. generally yep. are in contact yep. with that's probably much more likely. there you go there you go but uh yeah i know th this is the thing we have to remember is that animals often unfortunately in the past especially have gotten reputations that they don't deserve for uh for aggression uh or for for you know killing or hurting people yeah we have to be careful because again large predators we just got to give them the respect of the distance they need we don't want to uh instigate any negative encounters because that can happen but let's just be wise about it that's right um Meanwhile, i think i'm gonna with this guy. i'm gonna little baby here Go back to those. It's so yeah, beautiful. The, You're putting so much. Light. I love the caustics uh, and the detail you're putting into that, that little <laughs> one as well. Yeah, again, and there, uh, keep in mind that, again, the caustics have to be the same size on the little one as the big one, right? Because that's a smaller animal, but I shouldn't make them proportionally smaller on the baby because it's the same surface. But it's really close to the surface, so there will be a few smaller, finer caustics on it that don't appear in the large one because they're focus closer to the surface. And that small distance makes a difference. In addition to that, though, I'm going to add some of these larger size caustics onto it because those are also going to be present in a, in a some, some fashion um, and proportionally will look larger on its body because it's a smaller animal. So I'm, all these complex. I'm wondering if this, it doesn't let me pen, right? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, here, I keep forgetting. I'm trying to think in like different dimensions because it's at an angle to how I'm holding it. So there we go. Yeah, this is uh, the the top down. Mm -hmm. The great camera. Should... I like that. It's nice because, like I said, it removes that distortion. I love it. Um, it's it's really a good way to to show things. Somebody said earlier, I like microscope streams. So I don't know. We may actually do that. We're, really we're fun, open actually. to any kind of crazy. Um, ah, you know, we can bring in some um, some ocean water to look at under the microscope and see what we find <laughs> from different areas, for example. <laughs> That'll be super surprising for us as well because we have no yeah. idea. <laughs> Although it depends um, on where, because if you have an oligotrophic ocean water, that's going to have very like that means like very very low nutrients. You won't have a lot of life in it either. So we might not expect to see much anywhere. Certainly a lot less than in pond water, which is very what we call eutrophic or uh, having a very very high um, nutrient content, organic content. I want to also point out once again, uh, if you're only just tuning in, you're wondering who are these two weird people. Uh, I'm Marcus, I'm with the Porpoise Conservation Society, and uh, so is my friend Julius there, but he's with, affiliated with so many different organizations. He's an award-winning artist, uh, a scientific illustrator. He, his work has been featured in, the, featured in the Smithsonian Museum, many other museums, actually. Yeah, Murals come out all the time. You keep talking are, about it uh, on, on your Facebook. I, I think there are over 30 museums now. Oh, know, close um, to that, something like that. Anyway, different <laughs> sizes. <laughs> um, on stamps and coins, I've I, I remember like a, a year ago, two years ago, I was at a, at a post office and they had those featured stamp collections. And oh, there was a, that it's shark a, set. That was a fun one. The, there was right. that Sharks of Canada set that uh, I illustrated and Andrew Perro designed. Uh, so we had a, a kind of a, a team where we joined up. He designed the, the overall layout of the stamps and how they were, you know, what, what we in, decided to include in the backgrounds and so on. And then I illustrated the animals on them. And, uh, and it was really wonderful because we had like what, five types of sharks that are in our Canadian waters here. And uh, it was it was neat, too, because not just, you know, getting to be able to illustrate some of these animals, which are among my favorites. I love sharks. Um, but also because they presented it uh, with an important conservation message. So the, the write up about each species uh, included something about, you know, how, um, you know, important it is for us to be careful to protect them. Uh, and I love to see that, you know, in, in media that's going to reach a lot of people, like stamps, for example, lots of people. Um, it's nice to have these these presented in ways that also deliver an important message to what a lot more people need to be hearing. You know, we all need to be hearing. I wonder how, how much variety is there among sharks? We said earlier, Goodness. cetaceans, I think there's like closing in on 100 yeah. now. Um, there may be a little bit more than 100, no? Um, depending on, uh, well... Okay, but also I'm thinking of like um, different populations, subspecies, and so on. But there, there, 
Yeah, there. If we include subspecies and, and and interesting populations, there I think over 100. But in terms of number of species, I don't even know. For sharks, wow, they are a lot more diverse. Not just in the overall body plan, which is huge, different from flat ones like angel sharks to long, skinny uh, cat sharks or the more typical sort of like mako shark shapes and so on. But in the number as well, there are now over 550 described species of sharks um, in the world. But there are new ones every year popping up, and a lot of them are from the deep ocean because we don't know the deep ocean too well. Another show we're going to have to devote to uh, the dangers that the deep ocean um, faces at uh, things like deep ocean mining for heavy metals. I'm going to have to Polymetal watch this recording back later oh goodness, and yeah. uh, just write down all the different <laughs> ideas that we had for the show. I yeah. should mention this is the very first time we're doing this. So if, yeah. if, you, if you've been, if you watched the first part of it, you've been wondering probably like, what are these guys doing? Like they, they don't get it right. But um, yeah, it's, it's our pilot episode. It we're is. still figuring out what to, well, I, what to do with this program. Oh, and we should say, if you guys on the audience have ideas about shows that would be really cool, mention it to us in the comments, in the chat, because... Um, you know, we're we're just basically throwing ideas around here as well, and there are some really things that, that need to be covered. But, but you know, we don't think of everything, and we're we're totally open to to reading suggestions from the audience too. It'll be fascinating to see what what people come up with as ideas. Totally, I'm I'm willing to try almost everything. We can measure the <laughs> surface tension on one of your plants. You just bring it over, and we hook it up to some instruments and figure out if go. it wants to talk to us like who knows <laughs> well i think that we want to we do want to kind of keep this as much uh, sort of conservation and and, and art fa uh, based as much as possible because that's always going to be an important uh, message for us but yeah there's so many neat things that we can find out about different things and there's aspects of science that overlap yeah, I think I, I think we wanted to explore how how terrestrial plant life mm -hmm. actually affects uh, marine oh, life yes. as well. That's an interesting yes, question. Yes, yes. Um, and of course, there's there's a whole a whole lot of plant life going on in the ocean, such as kelp, Ooh. so important. Well, uh, not exactly a plant, but it is a photosynthetic um, organism. Oh yeah, that, that's another thing. Oh my goodness, the <laughs> the way in which uh, various uh, groups of of what are often called algae um, have evolved to become multicellular. Uh, and photosynthetic, similar to plants, but not plants, completely independently, like kelp, for example, our kelp forests in the oceans, crucially important to, to um, marine uh, communities, much richer com marine communities as a result of kelp. Uh, these are not plants at all, they, but they have similar sort of structures as plants. They have these long blades at the end that function like leaves. They have these, these stipes, which are like stems, and they have these hold fasts at the bottom, which function uh, at least in, for that aspect of roots that, that, that hold them in place. Uh, they don't gather water like roots, but they, they, they do hold the, uh, the organism down. But they're not plants, but they look sort of like them, completely independent. If you wanted to imagine what aliens are like and alien ecosystems, <laughs> Just look no further than some of the wonderful um, life in the oceans. Um, it's just fantastic what we find there. Somebody's asking, that's, a, that's actually an interesting question, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm, as always, whenever, whenever I read those questions, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch back and uh, just show the wonderful painting. I, I really love this uh, top-down shot, actually. Yeah, Next I, time, we're going to figure out how to crop this so we get <laughs> the window <laughs> gone from this. <laughs> um, but there's a question Hodge Boy asks, why exactly are they not classified as plants? Ooh, yeah, good question. Um, well, plants are, are defined, uh, at least in part, by a particular evolutionary clay. They evolved from an ancestor. Uh, and a lot of the features that they have, the particular kinds of chlorophyll that they have, there's not just one kind of chlorophyll, there are different kinds. There's chlorophyll A and B, but there's other kinds as well. The kinds of chlorophyll plants have features of their cells, the particular kinds of chemicals they um, involve in their cell walls, all sorts of different things, the way in which they reproduce. All of these things help to define plants um, structurally and, and physiologically, but also they share a common ancestor, which was likely a green algae, actually. Uh, and all plants evolved from this common ancestor. And algae of the type like kelp evolved completely from a different ancestor that is sort of like a cousin, like a distant, distant cousin to the, the green algae that evolved into plants. Uh, that particular um, type of green algae and and like kelp are are, are in a group that are, are known as the uh, commonly as brown algae they're a completely different group but they became multicellular independently of plants that's so cool i think um 
So it's partly just their their evolutionary history that defines the, the group of plants. Um, they all kind of uh, are related to each other more closely than to other groups. Um, so it's, it's just really neat to see this diversity and convergence. The convergence being that different organisms that have different ancestors can converge in their appearance or their function on each other to look or behave or, or function similarly to other organisms to which they're not closely related only because they share a similar environment and have had the similar kinds of selection pressures on them. And their ancestors therefore evolved to look or function similarly, even though they're not closely related. That's called convergent evolution. And it is fascinating. And kelp and, and plants are a great example of a convergent evolution this way. Yeah, and I think we're probably going to feature evolution uh, mm -hmm. quite prominently on this program as well. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it infuses everything. It's just fascinating. <laughs> I would love to talk about the evolution of cetaceans as well, because wow. I think you mentioned yeah. earlier they're not they're not perfectly hydrodynamically shaped. So there's always a little bit close. of drag, and that's yeah. just one of the many things, uh, one of the many ways in which they're not perfectly adapted to the environment. And why that happens to be is it's a really interesting topic just by itself. Well, right? that, that that kind of shows how environments change over time and how an organism needs to be able to survive in more environments than one very, very specific one. And, and, and because of that need for flexibility often, since different environments are slightly different in, in, in conditions, no animal who exists in more than one environment and can inhabit it can be perfectly adapted to uh, all of these environments typically. So you're going to have a little bit of that inefficiency anyway, uh, sort of built in. But that is also a benefit, as I say, because it, it gives them the generalists, animals that, that are able to make use of, of a wider uh, set of niches. Uh, are very, very successful under trying circumstances. And they're often the survivors of, of sort of catastro catastrophic events like mass extinction events. And so this is something we often find um, uh, that generalists survive these mass extinction events. And they're the ones that are less perfectly adapted to any one set of conditions, but uh, are basically kind of a jack of all trades and are able to survive under a wider range of conditions more effectively than specialist animals and plants. And um, I, I just cut back to uh, to show the top down view as you're drawing. Mm -hmm. uh, you've you've gotten to the fluke now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The uh, orcas have this wonderful white underside to their flukes, um, and uh, now this is where somebody who is uh, a better uh, informed than me uh, about the local populations of orcas. Um, can tell me whether or not this is true, but I think that some of the patterns of pigmentation on their flukes, the white and the black, because it's mostly white on the bottom with, uh, with a rim of black, can be useful in helping to identify individuals from pods of orcas. And so there are catalogs that are published that show the characteristic appearance of different individuals. And this is important because when we're talking about groups such as the southern resident orcas, which only have 74 individuals left, we really want to know as much as we can about how they're faring. And so, for example, if you look at orcas from above, uh, like from drones or helicopters, you can see that they have a particular shape um, and the width of their body in different parts t says something about their relative state of health, uh, the amount of fat, for example, they have and so on. So they've actually used these um, top down uh, photographs of them to identify how well, individuals are doing based on our ability to identify individuals. And so you can see if some individual is getting better resources over time or worse. And in some cases, you can start to see them starve, unfortunately. And you'll start to see this, um, what's called, I think it's a peanut shape, was it? Um, yeah, peanut head. Peanut head, yeah, peanut yeah. head, right. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a characteristic appearance that shows up when they are so starved of resources that they're starting to really lose way too much of the, the fat under their surface, under their skin, and it changes the uh, actual profile of the whale and its appearance. Uh, and those are really bad signs that, um, that they're suffering uh, nutritionally. So we need to be able to identify individuals and the characteristic shape of their markings and how they differ from each other individually, it's really helpful. It's not true only of orcas. This is especially true of many others, humpback whales um, and many other types of whale species, for example, have these characteristic almost fingerprint like patterns of pigments on various parts of their body, especially in, in those species where that have these distinct sharp 
um, lines of, 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 of tones from black to white or gray or whatever and not the, the smooth gradations. These are very useful as fingerprints, basically. Maybe as, as I go back to uh, showing that top-down view of that orca you're drawing, uh, maybe we can talk about the way that they get that shape. How do they... Uh, I, I think there is... It's mostly blubber, right? It's mostly fatty oh, right, tissues right, that right, gives yeah. them that, mm -hmm. that round, hydrodynamic shape. Yeah. I think they have two kinds of blubber, metabolic blubber and structural oh, blubber. So that, that, that I'm less familiar with as well. That's an interesting <laughs> question. I think you're probably a little bit better, you're more knowledgeable than that than me. But I also that wanted That was the to... extent of my knowledge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I um, want to... I'm going to share a different image that I... Uh, also produced a while back for another one of these sort of how to draw sessions on uh, this i want to do this for a particular reason i'm just going to find it is, here. is, is this the longest how to draw anything yeah, session you've it ever might done? be it <laughs> might be and i know we're stretching it out we're actually <laughs> we should probably keep it shorter but you know we, we we're trying this out new and see how it works so we don't have a, a time frame is that this is the pilot we're trying to go. find the pain threshold for our audience yeah. how long can they take <laughs> exactly <this>? that's it <laughs> yeah so here we go so this image uh, i want to call attention to look at the lower right um, I'm actually going to zoom in a little bit. That is uh, a composite drawing of the, the skull of the animal and then the soft tissues on top of it. So notice the skull does not match up really well in its shape to that of the profile of the animal's soft tissues with the skin intact. And the, a lot of the big reason for that is because there are layers of everything from muscle to blubber on top of it. And whales uh, and cetaceans in particular have a lot of blubber a lot of the time. And that helps to hugely define their shape. If we were to draw a picture of these animals without knowing anything else about the biology of, of uh, cetaceans and only go from the skeleton up, uh, and, you know, if we really didn't know how, how these were built or anything about, uh, you know, the, the shape of the texture of bone, uh, determining how much tissue is above them and so on, we would draw a very unusual looking whale, I think. <laughs> and a lot of the time, I think in the past, a lot of paleo artists um, drew very inaccurate images of um, whales and other animals for which, let's say, only bones were known or the remains, the, the fossilized bones. And so we have to be careful and, and uh, reconstruct them accurately. And this is a really great example of how different the skeleton or components of the skeleton look from the soft tissues above them. Also, you'll notice that above it, there's a really large what we call a melon. That's that bulge at the forehead. And that is very important in, in whales for echolocation and for making their calls. Uh, underwater for generating and also reading the calls and, and the shape of the skull some of these areas are actually evolved to be able to receive these calls effectively as is uh, I think some of the soft tissue around them so really important structures uh, for communication it's really neat stuff so yeah there we go that's how different the skull of the whale looks from uh, from its um, uh, you know, the finished whale <laughs> with all of the components <laughs> intact, <laughs> which is how we like to see them, especially finished <laughs> and complete and intact and alive. That's what we want. We want more living whales. So that's what we're doing here, doing everything we can to promote a world with more living whales in it, because the vast majority of, of species of life on Earth, uh, especially in areas that have really been settled by humans, are depleted compared to their historic numbers. And so uh, this includes uh, orcas, many other whales. We are lucky to be in a, a world that now has a ban on the whaling of most species of whales in most countries, which has allowed humpback whales, for example, to bounce back from, uh, I think, a 1966 number of, was it only like 35,000? Fewer than there are orcas alive today, to current... Uh, populations that are now in excess of 130,000, I think. So really bounced back a lot, and still they're not at their historic level, I think. Now, I think that there is also a concern voiced by some that they might grow so quickly that they might outstrip their, their sort of their carrying capacity, but I'm not entirely sure how well that's supported. At the moment, they're still not at that level, I think. And the vast majority of whales are far below their historic numbers, including, um, well, for example, even the, the southern residents, which are lower than what they were historically, even at their lowest points. 
Yeah, so. I think I think I mentioned I mentioned earlier that we're still discovering new species, uh, even cetaceans. Yeah. And often oh, when, when we do, uh, they're usually <laughs> once we have some population data uh, immediately declared uh, at least endangered. Yeah possibly critically endangered because there's there's a reason we haven't seen these animals before we exactly haven't, we haven't seen those species before <laughs> they're already very rare and some animals are naturally rare even before disturbance that that happened there that's something that is a, that is a component that you know a part of, of all ecosystems that there are some species that are more common and some that are more rare um it, it happens a lot but uh, one of the things that unfortunately we've seen is that by our activities, by human activities, m many species have become far more rare than, than is natural uh, in ecosystems. And this is something we have to be careful and try to avoid doing and to try to reverse the damage that has been done before they go extinct. Because remember, we've already lost one cetacean species recently uh, to extinction, the Beji, which was especially sad not only because it was a species of river dolphin of which there are very few around but it was a whole it represented a whole family on its own and i don't mean like family like you know my family my my parents and my sister and so a family in a taxonomic sense where there are species that are organized into genera you know a genus like or orcanus orca is this the genus and specific specific epithet of of, of orcas but above that, there's family, which includes several, often several genera and species. But for, for the Beji, there was only one species in this entire family, or just sort of genetically very distinct group of organisms that it represented. Losing that species of, of dolphin meant that a whole very large, distinct, genetic distinct um, a group of, of, of um, remaining uh, cetaceans was lost that way. A huge amount of diversity proportion it was lost when we lost that one species. And now, you know, we're fighting to keep the vaquita alive. And this is what it was the, the, the broadcasts of the International Save the Vaquita Day that we're doing annually that um, spun off into what you're seeing today. This, this broadcast um, that focuses on art and conservation. I always do a segment during the International Save the Vaquita Day broadcast that features me drawing or painting a vaquita. And we're doing that because there are fewer than, there are probably anywhere between 8 and 13 individuals of vaquita left in the world, in one tiny area in the Sea of Cortez. Um, and so now, you know, because they're getting caught in uh, gill nets that are set by poachers uh, for another species of also critically endangered fish, uh, that they're a similar size and shape to, they're also drowning in these gill nets. Uh, and that is the source of, of, of the threat to them for, um, you know, against their entire species existence. And we're trying in any possible number of ways to try to prevent their extinction. And Marcus is the, 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 the wizard that has been um, spearheading our broadcast for that every year and it is amazing what we're uh what he brings into this every year it's more more complex and more streamlined efficient uh with more options and so on and now we get to reap the benefit of all of that that well, um planning. i'm just gonna uh, i'm just showing people the white yeah. chart so that so they can the see if you, if you just wave above <laughs> your head like above the light there that, <laughs> that's that's i'm gonna grab my head yeah <laughs> uh, yeah we just like you said, we... Oh, man, I'm reversed there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my head. <laughs> we were doing International Save the Bikita Day broadcast. As you said, we do every year, and we were just wondering how we, how could we make better use of all that technology mm -hmm. if we already have it. It would be kind of a shame if we only do this yep. once a year. So, um, yeah, we ended up with all of this, and now we can... We can, show, yeah. we can show Julius uh, as he's uh, <laughs> painting. Here we go. Um, Almost there. There was a question about... And that's interesting. We can explain that while while you're drawing. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what the purpose of the orca's pattern is specifically? I find mm -hmm. the white blob close to their eyes. Interesting. We talked about counter shading that's earlier, but question. this is. Oh yes, yes, yes. You know, I, I seem to recall some reading about this at some point. Oh, it was a while back. Hi, uh, I'm going to say right now I don't know. Um, and for scientists, that's yeah. actually really interesting. Yeah, yeah we, right. We, we're, we're really curious. Absolutely. If we exactly. don't know something, that's that's what drives oh, that's science. A really great right? question. Um, yeah, somebody in the audience probably actually knows this already. But um, in a general sense, 
eye spots in animal or in animal species are very common as markings, uh, marking patterns that resemble eyes and other parts of the the body than the eyes. In orcas, they happen to be right next to the eye, actually right behind it. Um, and I don't, I doubt they function similarly to other animals. But you'll see, for example, in moths and butterflies, a lot of them have these extravagantly, extravagantly beautifully colored eye spots that sometimes look a lot like real eyes of animals. And in those cases, they often use them as a way to fool would-be predators into thinking that that's where the animal's eyes are. Now, in many species, that, that's what happens, including in many fish. Eye spots are placed near their tail so that the predator goes for the tail, thinking that's the head, and it'll you know, try, try to disable the animal by biting into what it thinks is the head. Meanwhile, the animal escapes in the other direction because its head is on the opposite side. In butterflies and moths, for example, and other types of organisms, those eye spots on their wings are often sort of hidden until they're revealed. And they're often revealed explosively by the animal. Let's say they're on the hind wings often, and the animal will suddenly move its forewings to expose their eye spots. And in those situations, whoops, it uses them uh, to startle a would-be predator. And that might give it just enough time to get away while the predator is recovering from this, this shock of like, oh my goodness, what just happened here? Why are these giant eyes looking at me? What, what is there? Is there another predator or another animal there that's larger than I thought this was? And while it's just, you know, in the split second it takes to try to figure that out, the moth or butterfly has a chance maybe to fly away, or better chance. Uh, so that is often another way in which eye spots are used. Now, this eye spot may actually not even be a true eye spot at all. It doesn't look like a real eye. And so I'm wondering if there's actually a different purpose to this entirely. And that, that's my suspicion. Although, again, I don't actually know, and I'd have to look into that. But that's a very, very good question. And that's something that we should all look into anyway, um, because those patterns are very distinctive. And they evolve this way. And whether they evolve with a you know, to fill a particular role, not that evolution is teleological or, or plans anything, but, but animals evolve because of certain pressures on them. And often the ones that survive, the ones that end up becoming the successful descendants that, that you know, that, that evolve, <laughs> that are the, the, the results of evolution, they end up being the ones that were better suited for some reason or other. And, um, and whatever was the reason for these eye spots to evolve, somehow they were better suited for the environment. Alternatively, sometimes some patterns may evolve because they are their coding for them genetically might be close enough to other genes that are that are selected more specifically because those genes functions are are more critical to the animal survival and that the environment in which the animal lives something in there is selecting for the presence of those genes and because they're so closely placed to those necessary selected genes uh, some features that define maybe color pattern may also kind of hitch a ride evolutionarily and be selected for incidentally um, and um, uh, because the, there's a smaller chance of them being uh, exchanged uh, between the, uh, between the um, uh, when we have uh, a recombination happening. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, sorry, I think I'm, I'm starting to show the, the results of my, my stomach <laughs> being empty. <laughs> uh, yeah, during, I, um, uh, I think I think we have about mitosis and mitosis. We have yeah. about ten minutes okay. left until we're hitting the until we're hitting the three hour three? mark. Three? Oh my goodness, that's long! <laughs> I didn't realize it was like that. You're right. Okay. Well, anyway, I'm basically pretty much finished with this image. Let me point out one last thing here uh, that is of importance. Here, uh, I did the caustics on the flippers a particular way. Here, uh, that flipper is not face on. Okay, if you have my hand here, oh my goodness, which way am I? Okay, this is face on. <laughs> We're seeing this flipper more like this, right? It's kind of looking toward us. So, if the caustic patterns on this flipper, which is almost towards, um, you know, horizontal with respect to the water surface, if they're kind of a uh, particular pattern, if you look at those caustics uh, this way, they're going to be like compressed in their appearance. And that's what's happening here. These caustics are compressed in this direction, okay? the way that it, it's it's angled toward us. And so that's another thing to pay attention to. That's basically what's happening along the top edge of the animal's back too. You see how I've kind of compressed the distance between the caustics so they're closer together. Well, because that's what happens. We're seeing it at an angle and you're seeing a lot of them sort of pile up on top of each other. Anyway, that's the last thing I wanted to say. This is pretty much finished as, 
as you know, as far as we go for portraying the animal, I can add some more details to it as well. Like for example, there's a little bit of a detail here with some of the the musculature that defines the the tail stalk and things like that. But this is going to be less important for the purposes of this show here. Uh, I'll maybe add some more details later when I get some time in my crazy <laughs> busy schedule. But for now, uh, we have effectively drawn an orca and a calf in. Uh, in a nice bonding maternal moment with the mother pushing the calf up toward the surface to get its first breath. I think I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> Maybe you, should, you can turn a little bit around on, okay. on this view. Let's try this here. So I'm going to turn it sort of right side up. Yeah. Have this camera showing it. <laughs> that's not the up, the top down camera, but um, it's pretty close to that. So that's kind of like our our natural position here, sort of thing, in in, in with what is really up. So the water surface would be up here, and I haven't drawn the water surface. Oh, that would be fun too. I love doing the under surface <laughs> of water, but that's too much for this particular show. Let's keep it in bite sizes. <laughs> there we go. All that. Well, it's been it's been a journey. Um, <laughs> I, I think, think it's been a hike. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> Quite a lot. It's, it's been yeah. a hike, <laughs> or, or, or a really nice long dive into the world of orcas. A nice long dive. Uh, I like that image. Um, Excellent. I'm just gonna. Where do I leave it? Sure. I'll put it a little bit so that it's more. In, in, there we go. Yeah. Almost a bit there. Pretty it. much all of it. Just about all of it. Tip of the. I love the caustics like in all your images. I have to imagine this is this is, uh, black paper. What kind mm -hmm. of? What it's kind a, of this is a is Canson it? paper. I love Canson brand because it has a really nice kind of a tooth. It's pastel paper actually. Um, and so if I were to actually if I hold it close to the uh, camera oh, here, You might be able to see the texture you see how it's um, you see yes. that that sort of uh, reticulated texture almost network like yeah. but those are um, There's a little ridges basically on the paper. It's yeah. what we call a tooth um, and it's nice because it it captures the the in this case colored pencil but also pastels in a way that it leaves little gaps between the pigment and it it generates this sort of natural almost stippling effect kind of like you know when you kind of draw a picture by points pointillism so it allows for this kind of very interesting mm, distribution of pigment and and no pigment um, and it, it helps to as i mentioned before reduce the appearance of those uh, individual lines if we're trying to shade with a pencil for example it, it makes it a lot more homogeneous looking if you wanted to make a nice smooth gradient so uh, i like it it's so beautiful. Uh, it's the first time I've, I've seen you use that technique, and on, on black paper. I mean, for for the orca, that was that was perfect. It's incredible how you're doing this, even in your mind, just doing the inverse thing, doing this like negative positive all mixed up. This is in my head that doesn't work. Probably yeah, you have that's... to think reverse way from how you apply shadows. Exactly right, right, right. That's so crazy. I'm, I'm. I think earlier we had somebody who said like, I think. Brand up was one of our moderators. She said, um, "I'm, I'm, I'm at most. I'm going to be able to to uh, draw a, a stick orca, and I, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm, I'm still in in that same face. Um, I, I'd be just like that. Uh, maybe in the future, in in one of those broadcasts, we can do a more traditional yeah, how to draw. How to draw? Because I've seen Absolutely. you do that with Makita. Yeah. It's the one of the most, most viewed videos that we have. Definitely need to do that. Yeah." But for today, uh, I want to thank Julius um, for being here in my little studio uh, for the Purpose Conservation Society and for all the other channels. I know uh, we have a lot of viewers uh, listening from the Marine Mammal Rescue community as well. Yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, Julius said he, li he likes all kinds of sea puppies, uh, <laughs> puppies of all kinds, and not just sharks. Uh, he spends a lot of time with those uh, harbor seal pups oh my goodness, as well. They're amazing. Oh, they're beautiful. Um, yeah, and we, we rescued, well, they're, they're rescued and then we rehabilitate them for re-release. And, and so, yeah, we do everything from caring for them for, you know, getting them fed to making sure they have a nice, healthy environment to start their life off and then release them at the end of the season. And then they're free to go on their own. It's just so rewarding to do work, whether it's helping to feed them or or just cleaning up their poop. I don't care. <laughs> it is a very tangible way that I'm able to contribute something that is actually helping uh, animals, uh, wild animals, get you know healthier lives in the wild and 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 saved from 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 death. It, it's just an incredibly rewarding experience. 
And it, it goes back to what you said earlier. I mean, we keep seeing saying in all these broadcasts, like no matter how small your contribution is mm -hmm. or how small you think your contribution mm -hmm. is, when it comes to conservation, really, uh, like every little thing matters. Yep. And at the rescue center, I was the one doing the dishes. I was doing exactly. dishes for four hours <laughs> uh, every shift. That was my favorite thing to do. So, and somebody had to do the dishes. Yeah, um, we're all cogs in, in in a machine. It's 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 a very important machine that needs to function. And and we're happy to function in whatever capacity we need are needed, right? And that's super important. And degrees matter. Uh, you know, sometimes people say, oh, if you're doing if you aren't um, uh, doing everything you can possibly in a certain way, then your effect, your efforts don't matter. Well, that's not true. Every small bit helps. You know, degrees really do matter. Small changes are still changes when we add everybody's efforts together. So don't be dismayed if you can only do so much. Uh, if you are doing something that you wouldn't otherwise do, specifically because you want to help to, you know, life on Earth to thrive in our presence. Well, then good for you. You're one of the superheroes as well. That's right. And I think that's a that's a great closing statement from Julius. Thanks so much, Julius, for being here with us <laughs> oh, today. I'm so uh, happy that everybody got a chance to join us. Thank you for everybody who tuned in. Or if, if this is a recorded one, if you're tuning in later, then thank you for watching now. <laughs> so. That's right. We're going to preserve this on all our channels. Um, I hope one of our moderators on the Marine Mammal Rescue community can make that a highlight the whole stream so that we can keep this uh, on our channel. But you can definitely watch it on YouTube and it's going to be on LinkedIn. What other channels do we have? Uh, we're on Facebook as well, uh, even on Twitter, like we're on all those channels. So wherever you were watching from today and wherever in the world you were watching from, we appreciate it. Thanks so much for your comments as well. Thanks also to the Marine Mammal Rescue community and the moderators there who have uh, kept our audience uh, company throughout uh, this afternoon um, and uh, we're gonna be back oh and and, and many thanks also for, uh, to Christine for helping out with um, all of the the background stuff that uh, I mean the, the two of us here are visible and so on but uh, Christine's been she's, busy in the background too she, she's our she's our producer and uh, she's watching this on a big TV screen in a room next door to make sure that we're actually here and people can actually hear us and see us <laughs> so yeah and with that, um, I'd like to wish everybody who's been watching a great rest of your afternoon, evening, night, morning, whatever it is. We have people <laughs> watching from all over the planet. Um, and uh, please feel free to uh, leave those comments still, uh, even under the recordings, if you want to let us know about your ideas for this program. We mentioned mm -hmm. earlier it's a, it's a pilot, uh, so yeah. it's the first time we're doing this. Uh, if you think this is all really silly and we should be doing this, <laughs> let us know as well. If you have any ideas, comments, constructive uh, preferred uh, then uh, yeah we'd love to incorporate that into the program and with that uh, i'm gonna leave us on a last shot of julius's beautiful drawing and we're gonna be back in yeah. probably in october mm -hmm. sometime in october we'll figure it out now and then stay tuned for the next episode <laughs> episode two yeah we'll be that's back great. and that's uh, canvas and currents everyone yeah. have a good rest of your day night morning whatever it is yeah <laughs>